Shane, by the time you'd finished, what, the fifth grade, you'd already had 100 films and commercials under your belt? Do you remember those days? I remember those days um, as a youngster working in, in Hollywood. Um, I got my start in, I was born in 1971. In the same year, Century 21 became a thing as a big real estate company. And a friend of my father's uh, was producing a series of commercials for them. And they said, we're trying to appeal to young families looking to buy homes. We need it. We can't find a kid that can sit and behave long enough to get these takes done. And, you know, I was literally sitting in the corner chewing on something. And my dad said, why don't you take him? So I started as a baby actor in front of the camera. Uh, those days I don't remember. Uh, my first memory of working on set was with June Lockhart. Um, you know, from Lassie, and uh, worked with June on some projects that my father was producing. Um, and then Lloyd Haynes from Room 222, uh, Ron Masak, who I'm still very dear with, who's Ron's been in everything from Harper Valley PTA, Tora Tora Tora, uh, he was a Velocic Pickle Stork, uh, Murder She Wrote, and then uh, was on um, Whitney and a Robot with uh, David Arkin back for NBC before I was seven years old. Um, so I grew up doing a lot of on-camera work as a youngster. And what was really interesting is my father got a contract with Encyclopedia Britannica to do all their, what they called burns and poisons and general safety films, the educational films of the 70s. Why well, was that kid? I was that kid that was riding his bike across the street without looking both ways and got hit. I was the kid who ran out in the street after his Frisbee or his baseball and got hit. I was, you know, I was got hit by cars in my dad's video. Um, you know, the kid that got electrocuted because he put the paper clip in the, in the uh, socket. And what was weird was this was mandated viewing in all the schools growing up. So we would have these assemblies and it was kind of weird because you were stuck with 500 kids in this auditorium watching your, your video and they'd watch you get electrocuted. They, I got to drown a couple times. I was the kid who got in the pool and you know went after something when nobody was looking and drowned. And, yeah, that was that was how I started my career. Reminds me of Scared Straight. Do you remember that? I know it well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember. It just kind of reminds me of, of I know it well. that was also mandatory viewing. Yeah, that's right. It was. It was. <laughs> so so uh, long story longer is my father. He had been a successful actor in the seventies, you know, and uh, fell in love with filmmaking. So he went all out and bought uh, a Moviola flatbed, a couple of RE sixteen cameras that he had. And at a very young age, I started learning how to splice film, run the Moviola, use an RA-16, and be an assistant, you know, whether I was doing the slate or assisting the editors that would come in to sync sound or splice film. And I actually enjoyed that kind of work a lot more than showing up on a set, sitting around for six hours to get 20 minutes of work in. Um, very young. So I retired in front of the camera probably before I was 11 or 12. Those days were behind me. But then by the time you were 19, you had won two Emmys? Yeah, I was nominated for four Emmys before my 19th birthday and won a two. Okay, blessing or curse? Um, you know, it, it sure was a blessing that night. You know, I was the toast of the town. I remember going to the after parties and hitting all those restaurants, being that that 16 year old kid walking around with an Emmy in the restaurant. That was cool. But um, you go back to school, um, life goes on and I was not sure what I wanted to do with my life. I was very fortunate to have the opportunity to work in the industry, but I, I wasn't passionate about it. I wanted to be a drummer for a season. I wanted to race dirt bikes for another season. And, and my interest kind of followed that. And I'd always get back into working in our industry because dad was doing a project, he needed help. Um, you know, hey, uh, somebody needs an AC. That guy that worked on our last film needs to hire an assistant cameraman. I want you to go work with him for the day. So I always got pulled back in and didn't try. And I think the curse was here's somebody who didn't put much thought or effort into what I did and had four Emmy noms and two wins before I had really been a year out of high school. Before I was old enough to drink, I was, I was that deep. And uh, when I finally decided to pursue this industry, I made a decision to put the Emmys in a closet. I got rid of them out of sight, out of mind for probably 10 years. Started at the bottom. My father had a wonderful assistant, Janet Stone, who uh, used to work at Castle Rock for Allens with Bell and Larry David. And I called her one day and said, I want to get into this industry. I want to start from the ground up. I want to start over and, and re repave the way to, to where I need to go. 
And she made a phone call for me and I had taken a couple interviews and was working at Castle Rock uh, shortly after and got fired from them after a year. And uh, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because I learned that, you know, what I thought I knew didn't matter. I learned how to become a good listener. Uh, didn't matter what I had achieved or done before. Fortunately, there wasn't the internet or IMDb, so people didn't look up their PA to see what my history was. So I started from the ground up and uh, worked with Castle Rock for about a year and a half on shows like Seinfeld, Sequest, All American Girl, um, Roseanne. And then after getting fired, wound up working for Entertainment Tonight for a year and a half until uh, Viacom took over the studio. And then from then went freelance and figured it out. Just started working wherever I could, doing whatever I could. What did getting fired teach you? What it really taught me was is, you know, you can still put the Emmys in the closet, but you still have a sense of belonging. You still don't feel like the bottom guy in the totem pole, even though I was. I was hired as the office PA at, at you know, 447 at Universal Studios during taping of a lot of these big sitcoms. So I was a nothing. And I think because of my upbringing and because of what I had experienced, I naturally felt like I had a sense of belonging that may have not been warranted just because of my own history, and that was on me. Um, I knew I was in trouble when they had uh, a very famous director by the name of John Rich come in to direct one of the episodes. John had done The Brady Bunch. He's been around, um, I think he did Sound of Music. Um, wasn't John Rich, it was another director. Uh, Bobby Wise, forgive me, forgive me. And um, I was told nobody's allowed to talk to him. He's a legend, if you're below the line, you don't look at him, you don't talk to him. Well, I walked down the hall to deliver my smart and final run and Bobby Wise is in the uh, cafeteria making himself a sandwich or a bowl of soup. And I said, Mr. Wise, how you doing? He looked at me and he goes, what's up kid? And I said, Wells Roots, my, uh, my godfather, Lee Stanley's my dad. And he stopped everything, gave me a hug. He goes, what are you doing here? Let's, let's hang out. And I think because I did what I shouldn't have done, um, it showed my bosses that I don't listen well. I didn't care what they said. I wanted to do what I wanted to do. And I only did that because, because he was a true friend of the family. My godfather and him had done three movies together and I knew who he was. And I got fired over that. Wow. So I learned quick. Uh, follow directions. It's interesting though, we won't go too deep into this, but how sometimes it's not actually that, it's someone's ego was offended. But anyway, that. <laughs> I, could, I could tell you it was. The showrunner's, husband, uh, showrunner's wife was my boss and uh, when I got fired, it was pretty interesting. I got brought in by the UPM who was a wonderful human being who worked for Castle Rock. He said, look, you did nothing wrong technically. It's just a weird dynamic, man. He goes, you know, you're not supposed to talk to a guy and then you end up knowing this guy. And he, I mean, this guy had been out of my dad's boat three times. I mean, that's how I knew. I mean, why not say hi to him? But I was told, don't talk to him. You know, yeah. I should have told my boss, look, he's an old family friend and I didn't, but. They, and those <laughs> are the, yeah, the unwritten rules of Hollywood that sometimes we learn, unfortunately. <laughs> Hence your, your book that you that we'll go more into. Thank you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think if you had been in your 40s and had won those two Emmys or been nominated for four, that it would have been a sweeter victory or you don't really think about that, it's just been your life? You know, that's a great question. I think at the end of the day, I often, I, 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 I went through a phase where I assumed up until I was 40 that I had peaked at 16 or 17 or 18. I think that's a dangerous thing. I mean, I talk about, I was very fortunate, very young to be a part of something that was successful. It wasn't me, it was the team, and I was just a lucky recipient. I mean, we had 33 Emmy noms in five years when we, I think we won 13 or 14 Emmys. So I was very fortunate to be a part of that because of my camera work or the, the other production work that I did on these shows. But, you know, you get to know childhood actors growing up like Macaulay Culkin or Adam Rich was a friend of mine or you know, working with Charlie Sheen for many years, and we talk about peaking at a young age. You know, Charlie's great success, obviously he had tremendous success through many years, capping it with two and a half men and anger management, but you think about Platoon and Wall Street, how that all happened before he was really, before he was 22 years old. Um, you talk to Adam Rich about the success he had as a youngster, Gary Coleman, and I, I always felt I could connect with those guys because of that. I understood what it was like to be very lucky, to be very fortunate, to be a part of something. Um, I never took it for granted. I never used it 
I don't think uh, to my advantage, but I couldn't help but think as I was going through my 20s and 30s, as I was trying to find my way and create and write and produce or direct or edit films, I, I, I got to get this, this kind of success. I, I got to achieve this. And though I had success through those years, it wasn't until I was about 40 or 41, maybe it's that midlife crisis, say I'll tell us that you get at 40, that I, I realized that I was chasing something that I was never going to never achieve again. It didn't mean I'd never win an Emmy again, but I was never going to win another one at 16. I was 40. And, you know, so you see people go through it every year. Hundreds of people win a statue. That could be me again. It might not be. Um, but I think the excitement of it was the fact that I was so young and that's what made it special. And you can't go backwards. You can't go back in time. Does the film industry make people crazy? And if not, why that perception? Yeah, I think there's a, a lot of crazy that comes hand in hand with being an artist anyway. There's an eccentricity with um, creative beings. We're dreamers. I think anytime you, you live your life based on kind of playing the odds of the lottery, how does it not make you crazy? As I, as I talk about in my book, um, what other business do you know of, really? You know, music, film, dance, art where you could literally be homeless living on a friend's couch and get an audition for that one role and become the next Gal Gadot. You could become the next, you know, Jason Bateman. You can be anybody. And, you know, you think about doctors, lawyers, successful business people. They, they have a path. They still may be trying to figure out that path, but they usually go to college. They'll often figure out a plan and a road Get, get their eye on a prize and work their way to it. You know, medical school being six years and then residency. That's, that's a game plan. For artists, for what we do, the game plan is bust your ass, you know, make it, you know, fake it till you make it. You know, it's, it's never give up. It's I can't quit because it, my break may come tomorrow. And I think a lot of people uh, coming up that way and trying to find their path uh, in their place, it, it can make you crazy. I've found trying to find my path has made me a little nuts sometimes, as I say, a little south of sanity. Um, I also find once we get in a position of authority, it's, I think n no other industry is, is, uh, is unkind as ours. And I know everybody says there's horrible people in every industry. I've been around every industry, you can imagine, because of what I do and the things that I've experienced and shot and I, it, it's mind boggling how people are treated. And yeah, the, I think the Me Too movement and then the aftermath of that and people and how we talk to one another was so long overdue. But it's, it's amazing what people get away with and I still think they get away with it, you know, how they talk to each other and treat people. I, and I, that, that can make people crazy, you know, I, I think it does. Sure. What about people's reactions to artists? You know, there's all these sort of stigmas that artists are selfish or whatever. Can we talk about other people's reactions? Can I swear? Uh, okay. <laughs> I was just going to well, say that. One swear word. One, one F-bomb. I probably <laughs> the only one. Okay. I, I have a brother who I, I love more than anything. He's very successful. And he has a motto that he's always kind of looked at what with what we do. And he's always said, look, you want to be an artist? Go paint in the fucking park on Saturday. Get a job. Life's a business. Don't, don't. You know, life's, life goes by fast. You don't want to look back when you're 40 or 50 and wonder what happened. You know, he's the smart squirrel that always stashed away during the winter, you know, for the winter months. And I, I see that. I, I came from a, uh, my mother was uh, from Manhattan, uh, from New York, a very successful lawyer was her father. She was a very successful real estate agent. Her brother is a, you know, is a director of primary care for Kaiser. And the fact that I didn't go to college, the fact that I just wanted to be a dreamer, uh, figure out what I'm going to do with myself. And, you know, the three choices I picked were, were music, dirt bikes, and film. So <laughs> you don't need a college education for either, and all of them are pretty, pretty big shots in the dark. I think people look at artists, and uh, as I call us, um, you know, people who, who express themselves for a living. Uh, a lot of people don't understand it. I, I find when I talk with different schools, uh, different institutions, a lot of parents 
um, are more supportive now than they were when I was growing up because you have things like, you know, somebody like Mark Zuckerberg coming along and creating Facebook. You have somebody who created Twitter or Pinterest and all these things that one day they, they wrote a, a code for something that made them a billionaire overnight. So I think we have a little more leeway and a little more grace from people who look down at the dreamers and the, the creative beings. But I still, I still get sad when I talk to a lot of the, the youngsters coming up and it's like they don't have the support from their family, especially the, the, the ones that are going to community college because they don't have the financial means to put themselves through a good school and they certainly don't have the support of parents. I, I actually encounter some very well-to-do people in the community colleges whose parents are like, I'll write the check to go to USC tomorrow. You wanna go to Yale? We'll make it happen. But you're gonna go down this path, you're on your own. And I think that's unfortunate. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a stigma still, um, but I don't think it's as bad as it was when, when I was coming up. Do you think people in community colleges, I know we're going off on a little bit of a tangent, but are less competitive with one another? I mean, I went to a community college. At that time, the internet was just starting up, so you couldn't look somebody up and say, oh, what's this person's deal? So you could be more anonymous. But I felt like it wasn't like uber competitive, and I was able to enjoy myself there. I've gotten to the point where whenever a community college says, would you, could you, can you, the answer is yes because there's a purity, there is a drive, there is a determination without prejudice. I find a lot of the people at community colleges now are on their second, their second wave of life. They're often parents, they take buses and public modes of transportation to get to school. They're putting themselves through, you know, paying a few hundred dollars a unit to try to get to something. And I enjoy that crowd a lot. Um, I do work with a lot of universities and I appreciate and cherish that time too, but the mindset is different. Um, I can tell you without naming names, there are universities that accept the fact that their students will not finish their thesis film after having three years to do it, and they still get a beautiful diploma and march down, um, march down the, uh, the stage. And I, I don't understand that. Our business will not hire you if you don't finish a task. If you don't show up and you don't deliver, you don't work. So I don't know why you'd reward them. And, and I had a, a chair at a very prominent film school university tell me once, we don't want to deal with the lawsuits. So we pass them. And if I'm breaking protocol by coming out and saying that, I don't care. That's how it is. And that doesn't happen at community college. You have guys like Dan Watanabe and Chris Rossiter and uh, some wonderful teachers who have been that and done there and spent more time on a set than most university professors have. And they are very happy to fail you uh, if you don't do the work. And I appreciate that because that's how it is. Remember Alex P. Keaton from Family Ties? He Love, was him. Always, Love him. <laughs> he was always- Marty through, McFly, yeah, come on. He was always yeah. throwing community colleges under the bus. That was his like go-to thing, but- uh, I, I think they are <laughs> salt of the earth mm -hmm. and, I, and I, 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 it's funny. I will tell you when they first, when I first wrote my book, and a few of the universities were getting excited and a few blacklisted me and um, just by the title of the book, because I, I used to be welcome to give lectures and workshops and speak. And then as soon as they read the manuscript that was, oh, well, well, the title of your book, you're out. And it's like, I have no problem with film school. If you didn't grow up around it, you need to learn these things. All I want to do is teach you what they don't teach you. There's the business of the business of distribution and how to get financing, you know, not French Neuer or what angle to put the camera and the lights at. There's so much more to learn. Doing your own deals, production deals, distribution agreements, actor agreements, how to approach talent, how to approach money. They don't talk about that in film school. That's what I, that's what I teach. And when I first got people excited about the book and it started like, well, you know, there's, there's nine community colleges out where you are and we'd really love to get you roped in with them. I, at first was a little kind of like, what am I getting into here? And I went and spoke for my first time at a community college and I never looked back. I loved the passion these people had. And they're not kids. We have people our age there. I mean, there's, I go to some of these workshops, there's people in their 60s and 70s trying to figure out their next chapter. And I love that, because they've been that done there. They're old souls, they've lived, they've scrapped for everything they've got, they've fought for every piece of real estate they own, usually. And I, I just think that makes for better artists, I think it makes for better human beings. Shane, in your book, What You Don't Learn in Film School, 
You say you've been rich and you've been poor. You like rich better. What did each experience teach you? What happened? How did you get from point A to point B and back? You know, I've been rich, I've been poor. And I, of course you like rich better. You want to be able to take your loved ones out to dinner. You want to be able to take a vacation. You want to be able to pay a, a mortgage bill or a phone bill when it comes in without breaking a sweat and figuring out where that's going to come from. Um, you know, when you, when you start out, um, you know, I was very stubborn. I wanted to prove my independence. Maybe it came from being unlucky enough to win two Emmys before my 19th birthday. But, you know, for my 18th birthday, I graduated high school on my 18th birthday, June 15th, 1989. I was in my first condo living on my own within a couple months after that. I moved right out and my parents didn't want me to leave. They didn't, they weren't saying, hey, get your life together. You need to get a house or move out. I just was like, wanted my independence. And, you know, it was amazing. You don't, when you're not educated like me in the fundamentals of life sense, I was an old soul when it came to dealing with the things that I had seen and experienced and witnessed as a young kid. But I, nobody, you know, really taught me how to balance a checkbook. Nobody taught me about where to put money or how to, how to manage money. So I was that kid that would make five grand and spend 10, you know, the next day, just assuming and then forgetting there were taxes and bills and, you know. So I, um, I learned very quickly how fast money goes. I learned very quickly how you have to promote yourself to work. We're, we're salespeople in this industry. We're, we're selling widgets, which are ourselves. We're selling a product, whether it's a script or us as an actor or a filmmaker. And, um, I learned what it's like to file bankruptcy when I was in my 20s. I learned what it was like to be evicted when I was in my 20s. I learned what it was like to have a car repossessed when I was in my 20s and then another car repossessed when I was in my 20s and another car repossessed after that in my 20s. So, you know, finally a light goes on and say, okay, this isn't working. And then you learn how to manage and then, you know, you have success. You work hard. You know, I was fortunate. I was a part of some successful projects and I liked Rich better because I wasn't getting my cars repossessed and I was able to go to nice dinners when I felt like it and I was able to you know pay pay rent or mortgage and not sweat um plus those are some big guys repossessing those cars there's some big guys and, and I learned at a young age not to fight them either I learned the hard way when, when they, they don't came to collect no they don't mess around those guys because they're they don't get paid unless they bring a car back and you know I didn't know that you know um, and those crowbars they have, the, they 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 don't mind swinging at them. I mean, they'll 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 hit you with them. But uh, anyway, um, so I, when when it came around again, I learned to be a little bit more responsible, not to live outside my means, um, and I I I'm not rich or poor now. I I I make a living being a filmmaker. I'm comfortable. Um, I. Don't ever take anything for granted. I don't regret any decisions I've made or what I've experienced. Um, sure, we'd all like to to be able to just thumb our nose and only do what we want when we want, but that's not what life's about. I've been in those chapters where you know you can go four or five years and not worry about work, and it's easy to become complacent. It's easy to become uh, put things in cruise control and lose the edge, lose the venom, as I say. And I find when I think of myself in a situation of needing to provide for my family, when I think about needing to keep a roof over my head and wanting to be able to have a nice dinner once a month or to take a little road trip with my wife, it reminds me I got to keep my, my nose to the grindstone. And it, I never get complacent. I'm always grinding. Can we, can we hear a story about a great time where you, you had the $5,000 payout and spent ten? And then maybe times when yeah. things were really bad and... I'll give you a better one. I remember the $25,000 days. Those were the fun ones. You know, when you get a phone call out of the blue, it's like, hey, we need you to do a commercial. It only pays twenty five grand, but we'll only need you for five hours. Can you come in? And you go, sure, I'll be there. And, you know, and I had a loan out company, so they didn't take out taxes. So, you know, you're getting a check for twenty five grand, And that's for like four hours of work. That doesn't, it's not a bad day, you know, or... Uh, I remember selling a script. Um, my first screenplay I ever sold, I got $125,000 for it. I wrote it in two weeks. That doesn't happen often. But you forget about agents, managers, lawyers, business managers, taxes. That that hundred and twenty-five dollars turned into about $51,000 really quick. I had already bought two new cars, four jet skis, two motorcycles. 
and took a bunch of friends to Vegas. So, <laughs> you know, stupid is easy come, easy go, right? So, you know, that happens. Um, as far as being broke, I, I remember uh, renting a house and knowing deep down inside I couldn't maintain it, but boy, it sure looked good at the moment and made me feel like the king of the mountain because it was on top of a mountain in the valley. And I remember after three months getting a call from the landlord. He's like, I'm sure you know, but you know your check bounced. And I was like, okay. And I'm looking at my bank statement, going, I got $320 to my name. I just bounced a $2,600 check. Yeah, you know, and then you're you're robbing Peter to pay Paul to to make rent. And uh, next thing you know, you're you're living with a buddy in his two bedroom apartment, paying him 300 bucks until you could figure it out again. And then, you know, because of this crazy business, I got a phone call and went off and did a five million dollar movie six weeks later. And I was back at it again, you know, making good money all in the unions. And it's just crazy business. So what I've learned to do is is to just just be and treat every every job as your last and every dime that you get that you may never get another. And I'm not stingy. You just become more prudent as you get older. You know, I'm going to be 50 next year. You know, I don't want to have to keep hustling when I'm 70. I'd like to do only what I want to do when I'm 70. And I've been lucky. I get to do what I want to do. But there's still the desire to get out and work so I don't have to worry. Those friends that you took to Vegas, do you still talk to them? Incidentally, no, no, <laughs> no, who? <laughs> nah. So when the money went away, those friends went away. It's like you hear about all the sports athletes and rock stars and the actors that when it's good, it's good. And when it's bad, it's bad. It's the same for us behind the scene guys. You know, when you're 19, 20, 21 years old and you're burning through 250, 300,000 a year, living on your own without any responsibilities, you're the life of the party. And then when you got to start telling your friends, you know, that's why I bought so many jet skis because I wanted my friends to come out and jet ski with me. They couldn't afford their own, so I'll buy three or four. Let's go out together. And then, you know, they call you and say, hey, let's go jet ski in this weekend. And you're like, yeah, I sold them. Well, those group of friends fall away. And then, you know, hey, I need to borrow your your truck this week. I I, I got to do something. Well, I don't have the truck anymore. I've only got my, you know, my, my two-seater right now or my four-seater car. It's like, oh, and then those people go away. You know, it's just like fair weather friends, sure. I, I have some great friends I've known all my life, but the people that went to Vegas back then, nah, I don't see them anymore. <laughs> Shane, in your new book, What You Don't Learn in Film School, was there a chapter or a section that sparked controversy? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think the most controversial chapter in the book is the one that's the most important, and that's to get out, dig ditches, get your hands dirty, and make yourself available, and, and whatever it takes to get on a set within your morals, values, and ethics parameter to go do it. And um, when I came up, as we talked about how I made phone calls and hustled to get work and get on sets, I worked for free. I brought my own lunch. I showed up first and left last. I was sweeping floors when it wasn't in my job description. And, and I have close friends that our generation grew up, you know, I have a friend whose father won two Oscars and his mother has nine Emmys. You want to talk about nepotism? And when he got his act together, like I did, he said, hey, you know, yeah, I want to work in this business. I want to be an editor. Mom picked up the phone, made a phone call. Okay, he'll be there tomorrow, two o'clock. Perfect. Thank you. Click. You got a job, you're sweeping floors at Color Deluxe, you're getting paid nothing, pack a lunch, dear. And he swept floors at Deluxe for two years, I think it was Deluxe, and he didn't have a problem with that. He thought, that's normal. Um, I had won Emmys at a young age and started over, and we talk about not being able to make rent. Well, there was something called Crew Call back when I was coming up, and you would literally subscribe for like $50 a month, you would call an 800 number, and you would say, you know, press one for camera, press two for sound, press three for, you know, electric. And you would press these things that you could do. And then you would hear about jobs and you would write it down and it would give you a fax number and you would fax your resume. You would spend a day a week doing that and pray your phone rang. And sometimes it wouldn't. So a friend would call and say, hey, I, I need, a, I need a, a swing in the camera department tomorrow. I pay lunch. You in it or out? And I was like, yeah, I'm there. The biggest problem I have today is when I talk to film schools or when people read that chapter about having to invest in yourself and build your resume. You know, so many people are, in my opinion, in film school are sold on hopes and dreams and um, being the next Tarantino or Damien Chazelle. 
And my advice is, well, if that doesn't happen, what's the game plan? So get out and learn camera, learn sound, learn editing, learn grip, learn gaff, learn AC, whatever you can. And if somebody can't pay you to do something and you have an opportunity to make new contacts, learn and be on a set, something good will come from that. You, would you rather sit home and play on your phone or play Xbox or watch repeated streaming shows that you've seen six times? You wanna get out and make new contacts. And I find a lot of people uh, think that's not the way to do it. And I also think, okay, well, over 85% of people who spend money and graduate from film schools never earn a dime in our industry. And there's a reason for it. And that's because they are uneducated on how to make their lives work and how to build a career base and contacts and become steady earners in our business. And the way I did it, the way I know a lot of people who did it, was they got out there and proved their worth by hustling. And some of the best workers, like we just felt, finished a film called Break Even that comes out. Some of the best workers on that film were the interns from like Pierce College. There's a kid that stands out. Um, he worked so hard every day, never said a word, head down. He anticipated everybody's needs. He was the guy that was cleaning up everybody's trash at the end of the night, showed up on days he wasn't supposed to be there just because he wanted to check in, say, I'm coming in tomorrow. Does anybody need anything? You know, and what I always tell people is when you make a movie and you're trying to carve your way, make it so the decision makers don't want to make a movie without you. And every time you do a film, you sure meet a lot of people you never want to make another movie with. But it's nice when you see those one or two diamonds in the rough that you say, God, I, I want to bring them back. And they were, they were somebody who was a PA. They were an assistant. They were a runner. And I think if, if people take that approach, as, as, as I say in the book, um, whenever you offer somebody a job, it's what's my credit, what's my pay? It's always the first question. What's my credit, what's my pay? And I think it, it needs to be okay, you know, take a breath and think about what the experience can do for you. I mean, I talked about in the same chapter, I talk about the, the best thing I ever did for my career was say yes to something I knew nothing about. I did it for free and it took up a month and a half of my life. And that was going to Bali, Indonesia with Zalman King when he directed In God's Hands. Solomon had seen my work ethic around a soundstage he owned in Canoga Park. I was sweeping floors and he was like, he walked in and he goes, I thought you were producing or doing something more important. And I said, yeah, everybody left. I wanted to leave your studio the way we found it. And he says, what's your name? And he came over and he talked to me and we befriended each other and he came and visited the next day on set. And next thing I know, he called me up and he said, hey, what are you doing in November or December? And I said, I don't know, what do you got? And he said, well, I'm doing a film in Bali. I think, I think uh, you should come. I said, and do what? He said, Shadow me, learn. He goes, I'll offer you free education working with me and, and we'll feed you and travel you and you figure out the rest. He didn't pay me a dime. And it was, it was like, talk about film school. You're sitting next to Zalman fricking King as he's directing a movie for a major studio. And I was on his hip for a month and a half doing that. And I learned more by just saying yes. I didn't ask what I get a credit and what I get paid. You know, and they limoed me to the airport and first class me round trip and gave me my own bungalow in, in a five store resort. I didn't ask for any of that. I didn't, I probably knew I'd be sleeping in a tube tent on the side of a mountain, you know, but they took care of me. And uh, I think that's the attitude. Obviously, you don't want to be taken advantage of. You don't want to get into a situation that's not healthy, but uh, there seems to be such resistance in getting out and experiencing work without worrying about pay. There's too many people that'll do it. Do you think that's because for, you know, our generation, Gen X, that there wasn't the term intern, you know, and some of, I, let's play the devil's advocate. Yes, interns can be taken advantage of in terms of Absolutely. people using free labor and, and not stringing them along and not giving them a job. Is that what they're afraid of? I don't know. I think, honestly, um, I think as a society, we have become pretty tender. I think we've become very sensitive. And I think people are afraid of exploitation, which I think is something we all need to consider. But, you know, I, I know I've got a nephew who worked his, his you-know-what off working for a financial institution in Arizona in Scottsdale, working 18 hours a day, getting their lunch, cleaning up their mess, getting them coffee. who didn't get paid much at all, but now he's an actual worker in that industry and he used that after college. It wasn't for college credits. He graduated college. His dad made a few phone calls and said, you're going to go sweat, you're going to wear a tie and you're going to go, you're going to go ride their, their wave. You're not going to get paid. You're going to learn. It happens in other industries. 
but it just seems in ours, I think it's because the hours are, are abused. You know, in a, in a normal workplace, you, it's an eight hour work day with an hour break. In film, it's 10 to 12, if you're lucky. And uh, I think people are afraid they're gonna be working 16, 18 hours a day as free labor. So it's hard to say why, but I never questioned that. I maybe, maybe it was just the fact that I could be on a set and make connections and learn. And I always figured, well, I could sit at home and wait for the phone to ring, or I could be on a set and meet a director or a producer who may find my, my job skills necessary to bring me to the next journey and then make a great connection and say, by the way, I have a script. By the way, you know, I also do camera. Can I get an opportunity? And that doesn't happen by sitting at home. It just doesn't. Right. Okay. Excellent. At um, least I don't think it does. I mean, you can upload YouTube and Vimeo until you're blue in the face. And, you know. Yeah, but working with, you know, being around people is, is a different experience. Absolutely. There's good and bad. To it. Um, best gigs and best opportunities I ever had in my life were showing up and working hard and proving myself as a worker who was competent and the people in the decision-making capacities going out of their way to say, hey, you know, appreciate your work today. Thank you. And then, you know, uh, we got something coming up next week. I want to get you on that. And then they start to appreciate you and you work these gigs. And next thing you know, you have an audience, you have an ear with the decision-makers. And when you want to move up in the world or they know people that will benefit by knowing you, that's all it is in this business. What caused you to leave the film industry for, what, two years? Two years. I did. To do some soul searching? Uh, I, I, had, I needed a break. I, you know, I, I got my first national commercial when I was nine months old. I had gone through the highs and lows, the riches and pores, been through a divorce, marriage and a divorce rather quickly. And, you know, as I used to say, my life was trying to have a, like having a picnic at the runway at that time in my life. It was very, it was very, a lot going on. It's very turbulent. And I, I was approaching 30. I was in my late twenties and you kind of hit rock bottom emotionally. I wasn't, you know, suicidal. I wasn't destitute, but I was emotionally done. I had been doing one thing and one thing only for so long, even though I, I dabbled in other hobbies or career paths suggest, you know, ideas coming up. I had only done one thing and I, I needed a break. I just needed, you know, it's one of those things. Is this really what I want to do? Is this something I want to continue doing? Is this something I want to pursue and put the next chapter of the next 30 years of my life into? You know, when you start coming up on 30, you do a lot of soul searching. You're not a kid anymore. You know, your 20s are coming up, being over, and you got to start thinking, you know, things haven't gone as I thought they would or I'd hoped they would. Is this something I want to keep doing? And it was the best thing I ever did. I actually went and sold cars. I went and sold cars for a Ford dealership for Galp and Ford. And it happened by accident. I was having lunch with the owner's son. We were good friends. And his father came in who owned a dealership. He came in and he looked at me and he said, you look like you don't look too good. And he said, uh, you look like your soul's been bought and sold down a river a half a dozen times. And I said, yeah, it's been a rough go. I'm going through a divorce, I'm going through bankruptcy. And I'm just, you know, business closed down. One of my partners went a little cuckoo. And he said, well, why don't you come sell cars? And I said, what are you, nuts? Sell cars? And he looked at me and he said, you've been peddling that crap you call art for the last 20 years. You've made a living doing that. You got the number one Ford dealer in the world. Cars sell themselves. You never went to college. You don't know how to do anything other than what you do. Why don't you learn and get an education? Learn how to listen. Learn how to sell. He goes, I promise you when you quit here, if you decide not to stay, you will take what you learn here and be better at what it is you think you can do. And boy, was he right. That was my college education, selling cars. What was that first morning like getting ready to go to Galpin? Well, they stuck me in a four-week training course. So I went and learned how to sell for four weeks under Lou Brown, who was a very world-renowned car sales guru that used to tour the world and teach salesmen getting ready to hit the floor how to sell. Um, I could, I would always been told I could sell ice to an Eskimo and we had 18 graduates in my class and I was the last one to sell a car. It took me three and a half weeks to move a car. And it got to the point where my boss pulled me aside and said, if you don't sell a car today, I'm going to, I'm going to request you to be transferred or fired. You're, you're not, you're not moving anything. 
and there was a cop that used to drive by the dealership. He lived in Palmdale. He worked at LAPD, nicest guy in the world. He used to stop by and visit me every other day. And, you know, he would just, he, I, I encountered him one day on the lot and we hit it off. And I, I, you know, I have a heart for cops and he was a neat guy. And it, I thought he wanted to buy a Ford Explorer and he would talk to me about it every day. And finally, you know, at that time, my boss yelled at me, said, if you don't sell, he showed up, the guy showed up that day and he said, you don't sell him a car today, you're done. So I walked out and he wanted to see me and I'm walking around a lot with him. And I, he looked at me and he said, you seem a little like something's up, what's on your mind? You know, he's a cop, they're intuitive, right? He was a detective. He's like, what's going on? You seem a little, I said, sir, if you don't buy a car from me today, I'm gonna get fired. <laughs> and he goes, you're kidding me. Your boss said that and I said, yeah. And he goes, well, we can't have that happen. I like it in the blue, let's wrap this up. Never saw him again. He bought the car and never saw him again. <laughs> the cool thing is I sold another car that day and then I started to become a good salesman. It was just about doing that. And that's what I try to use in teaching a lot of the kids about writing their first screenplay, uh, going on their first audition, working on their first show, shooting your first project, even if it's on your phone. Until you do it, you don't know what it's like. And then once you do it, it gets easier. And you'll fail, you'll make a lot of mistakes, do it again, fail again. But every time you do it, you're not gonna make the same mistake twice. It's like, I've been at this a long time. I've been a producer filmmaker going on 30 years. And I make mistakes every time I, I, I make a film. I make, I make mistakes, but I don't make them twice. So every time I make a movie, I make a new mistake. And then next time I know I won't make that mistake again. And you grow, you grow. And, and that's what I try to encourage the young, the young storytellers coming up is it's okay to fail, fail often, get it out of your system. When did you feel you were ready to go back in? You had sold some cars, maybe you got your confidence back up? I worked, I committed to do a year. I ended up working 18 months with Galpin and it was the most incredible years of my life. I'm still very close to the ownership. I'm still very close to a lot of people I sold cars with and I'm still close to some of the customers I sold cars to. I was in 18 months, there were some issues with a manufacturer that was not Ford but that was very public when they had tires that were ripping off of cars and I had sold probably 300 Ford Explorers over my 18 months there and I came into the office one day and had over 300 messages on my my phone after taking a weekend off and it was customers freaking out and I realized that um, this is probably a bit more than I this is this is it's time and, and it, that I had been nurturing that I had passed on two movies that had come to me during the time I was there because I wanted to commit to to the family that that brought me a job and provided me a very good living working there and an opportunity but it was the it was the fire debacle with the Ford Explorers that was uh, the end for me that's when I turned in my uh, my name plate and turned over my sales books and said it's I'll give you two weeks and they said we don't do that here you know we don't and, and that's just a policy because they don't want you taking customers in case you sell cars elsewhere which I never did but I that's why I left. I was that was it was time, and I stepped right into a great film that I did with my father, and uh, never looked back. And that was in 1998, 99. Have you ever thought about taking that story of working for the car dealership, working for Galpin, and turning it into a screenplay? I've thought about turning my experiences into working in the car sales business many times. Um, there was a great film done years ago called Suckers which shows the dark side of a dealership. Now, the cool thing about a dealership, and Galpin is a first-class organization. I mean, they're the best in the world at what they do, but there's still the, the people that work there that make it interesting. The family runs a tight ship. They're the best in the business. They sell more cars than anybody, but you still have the riffraffs. And I say that with, with, with fun because what I, what I learned is in Lou Brown's class, he said, nobody sells cars for a living because they said, I, I wanna sell cars for a living. People, if you think about it, everybody who sells cars didn't grow up saying I want to sell cars. They failed at something else. They, they went through a divorce. They, they had hardships. They lost a business. And, and it was so true. I remember in our class that we had 18 people graduate, 35 of us started. Everybody else had a story about a career that failed or a job that closed down or a divorce or a circumstance. So you have these unbelievable people from all walks of life, from all nationalities, all different classes of, of financial and background and pedigree. But there was a film called Suckers that I watched and it, it was so scary on the nose when it came to the business of the business that I thought you can never, you, you're never gonna touch that. So I developed a TV series that when I was working with David Madden at Fox, 
I got very excited about. I was developing TV shows for Fox uh, when David was there. And um, everybody loved the concept. They thought it was great. But you'll notice there's a reason that car sales shows are not on TV. And that's because the number one sponsorships of your ad dollars are usually car sales. Uh, Car manufacturers, you know, you've got Mazda, you got Buick, you got Honda, you got Chevy, you got Kia. It's endless. And they take those primetime slots to show families what they could be driving. So if you are going to tell the true story of the business, you're not going to get those ad dollars. So I found through some really high up connections in, in television sales, broadcasting, and, and decision makers that you're not the first who's come with the idea. It's a great idea that we can't touch because that's where our dollars come from. So, but now that there's a streaming ability, I should recircle that. You know, that's something worth thinking about because you know, if you're doing a show on Netflix, you're not worried about selling Cadillac commercials. This is off topic a little bit, but then Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross was okay. Wall Street, Wolf of Wall, like so. It's okay to see one sector of sales. Yeah, but that was in car sales, right? It's it's the fact that Buick. If you watch a network show. Watch This Is Us. I know you're probably doing what I do and skipping through your commercials on DVR. I guarantee you a third of the ads you see on any show are going to be from car manufacturers. If you show a show that shows the dark side of that business, how do you get a car company to pay for ads of that show? You're going to have a hole in the advertising. But you're right. But those were films. Glenn Gary Glenn Ross was a great film. Wolf of Wall Street, great film. But Wall Street is its own thing. They're not buying ad dollars. They're just, you know, pulling the strings of our globe any way you like. But I, I just thought of it as we're sitting here talking is, you know, you can do series for Amazon, you can do them for Netflix, you can do them for all sorts of different outlets that don't require ad dollars coming in. So maybe it's time to dust off some of those and right. see, see. And it's also nice because you can kind of cross some lines and push the envelope on those platforms too. You could do an ensemble thing like with Crash where you, you focus different different stories, people getting ready to go to his training class. Anyway. Best thing I ever had happen is I remember taking a family of six. I remember taking a very nice conservative family of six on a test drive in a, uh, uh, I forgot, I think it was the Windstar, Ford Windstar family van. And I remember the father was driving and the mother was sitting, and I'm sitting in the next rows with all the kids. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the father, he's doing like 55, 60 miles an hour down Sepulveda Boulevard. He looks up, slams on the brakes. And what happened was one of the salesmen had taken a nap in the back of the Windstar and woke up during the test drive. And father's driving, all of a sudden, this guy with his hair all disheveled. <laughs> it could have been a porter or somebody he popped up from the back. I mean, that's kind of stuff that happens. It, dealerships. I mean, you're dealing with crazy people, all walks like they're party animals. I've partied with, you know, Poison, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, and Van Halen all in the same night with Charlie Sheen on the side. And I will tell you, the people that work at car dealerships, they can drink them all under the table. I kid you not. That's a whole different breed. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's really funny. That's really funny. That's a great story. Without naming names, can you tell us a story about how a studio took, was it your script or one of your ideas? Which time? Um, I, I'm really a big proponent on protecting your work. Uh, I will go on record to say, don't waste your 20 or $30 doing WGA West. It's a waste of time. It doesn't do any good. Um, it's not going to do what you want it to do. Spend the extra $25 and do it with the USCO, the U.S. Library of Congress. Um, U.S. Copyright Office is what that stands for. The process is just as easy. The copyrights last forever, not five years. Copyrights uh, cover your legal expenses to defend the fact that you got ripped off. And as we're young and naive coming up in Hollywood, we tend to really love to share our work with people. And I always tell people, don't you dare send a script to anybody until it's finished and copywritten because it's too easy person you're sending it to could steal it. The person that you sent it to could send it to a friend who needs an idea. Or, hey, I'm thinking about getting into screenwriting. Do you have any scripts laying around I can look at and kind of use as a model? Well, the easiest thing to do for a new writer is to look at somebody else's work and just copy it. It's just what, it's what happens. I've been ripped off over the years. I actually had a script get produced by a studio who I'll not name. 
They actually went out and made the movie. It was a $9 million indie, low budget film that they, they put the money behind to make. And they were dumb enough not to even change the title of the film or the character names. So I guess whoever brought it to them took my work and just put their name on a cover sheet and just did it as is. I got in wind of this when they were in post. And what you're supposed to do when you get ripped off is you let the film come out, like let it get on the books and let the trailers start hitting. And then that, that Monday before the Friday is when you drop your bomb because they are so vested in this with the 20 million in P&A or whatever it is, they're gonna work out a deal with you. And instead, stupid here, knew somebody who knew somebody who worked at the studio. When I heard it was in post-production, I made noise about it, and then the film just disappeared. It never came out, it was never finished, but they indeed, um, my friend got me a copy of the script. There was a polish on the script, but they kept the names the same, they kept the title the same. I go on IMDb, it's still there, unreleased, 15 years later. But uh, it's just kind of funny, This this, movie got made that never never even got finished. No release. So that was one. I've had agencies uh, take projects and give them to showrunners days after we meet on them, um, sometimes hours after. Um, I've had a project that was packaged by a major agency in an 07 when the crash hit, my investors backed out. We were three weeks away from rolling film and you know when the, the 07 recession hit, my investors had to back out, so the project never got made. And then, weirdly enough, two years later, the packaging agent got a new client who shot pretty much the same script, wound up making it into Sundance and doing quite well. And at least they changed the title. They changed the character names. And the best part was they changed the opening scene. But the rest of the movie was pretty much in step. So, you know, I don't make noise about that stuff anymore. Um, I've learned, and that's probably why I've become an independent filmmaker. If I have an idea I'm passionate about, I'm not sending it to you, I'm just gonna go make it. Um, that's where I've gotten, is I just don't share my work with anybody. If it's something I believe in and wanna do, it stays in house and we'll, we'll do it. So that's usually how a lot of people do it. If they feel their idea has been stolen, they wait till the week of. Well, you'll often hear about a film that comes out and you'll hear Writers are making noise, they said their idea was taken. And that's usually when the film is coming out. And what happens is, is you get the studio or the network so vested in the project, they've completely paid the entire process. Now they're going through the marketing and PA and they've committed a good year, a year and a half to the project. And then all of a sudden it's coming out. And you know, it's not common, but it's not rare where you hear this movie's coming out and there's a couple of writers who say that they were ripped off. And more often than not, those stories disappear and go away. And I think if you're able to prove it, um, I always say, you know, you have to take copious notes. I always say, uh, have a backup email address. So anytime you send a script to somebody, send it to another address you have and keep those things, print them out, save them on a cloud. So you have a track record. If you send a script to somebody, you have a conversation with somebody, keep a journal. Hey, I spoke to this agent at this agency on this day about this actor and this project. Because, you know, it's just, if you're gonna ever make noise that you, were ripped off, you have to have, you have to have chapter and verse, copious notes on everything that, that you've done or there's just no, you know, ideas don't cut in anymore. You have to show that there was an interaction. Well, it's kind of like the guys that pointed the finger at Zuckerberg for ripping off Facebook. I mean, they still probably got two, three, four hundred million dollars. It was an undisclosed settlement, but they were able to prove this guy took their platform and did something else with it. And that, you have to think of it the same way. You have to have the blueprints for your work, you have to have detailed journal, you have to have your communications, and when they were, what they were, and who they were with. So, yeah, and copyright them with the Library of Congress. So is that, uh, is that true that it's easier for Hollywood to just deal with the lawsuit than pay? I think everybody likes dealing with a lawsuit than going through the, the painstaking, uh, it seems everybody today wants the easy way out. Uh, it's easy to rip off things. It's too easy to take advantage. I know a very prominent producer who's since passed away, so I'm gonna tell the story without mentioning a name. You know, he found a script. He was he was a very successful producer, and he had been nominated for an Oscar or three, and found a script from an unknown writer who wasn't in a WGA or anything, and basically worked out a deal to pay the guy peanuts, and wound up becoming a very successful trilogy and you know, just bought and sold the script over and over until he got it where it needed to go. And you know, it's, 
it just seems like Hollywood's kind of copying itself anyway. I mean, that's what it does, right? Every story's been told. It's how we tell it. You know, shark movies are big right now. Let's make a shark movie. Football movies are big right now. Let's do a football movie. I mean, you know, I, we capitalized on that with Gridiron Gang. You know, we had We Are Marshall, you had Invincible, you had We Are Giants or Facing the Giants. Yet uh, Friday Night Lights, it started it. So you had this movement of football movies. And it's no different. I mean, that's just what they do. Incidentally, what's interesting is the same guy who took that script for Peanuts, it turned out, admitted to me later he was trying to make Gridiron Gang with another studio and he never had the rights to do it. So it goes to show you, you know, it's people will just easily take an idea and run with it. And uh, yeah, he never had the rights to do it. <laughs> you know, how do you feel when somebody rips off your work? It's, I guess the old saying is imitation is the greatest form of flattery. But when you're reading the front page of the trades and a big star is attached to a project that you walked into an agency or a network. You know, my dad always talks about how he had brought in a, uh, a script back in the, in the early 70s called Special Weapons Assault Tactics and was told, mm, nah, it's not for us. And then, you know, years later, da 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 So I, uh, I learned, you know, be careful with your product, but how does it feel when you're ripped off? It 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 hurts because you have that. It, it's almost you know it's like if you've ever walked into your house after it's been robbed. It's the ultimate. It's the ultimate betrayal. It's the ultimate form of of uh, you know uh, it's a violation. I don't know why somebody can't just say, "Hey, kid, you wrote a script. It's pretty good. The idea is there. We want to take it and work. We're going to pay you." I mean, just the deception that happens with these things. And I, I can't emphasize enough that you have to. I mean, it's, it's it feels empty. You look at that time and you, most writers especially write things on spec because one day wouldn't it be great? And then one day you have a library of scripts that you can look back and say, yeah, these 10 scripts. But each script takes time, whether you're a fast writer or a slow writer. I know people that spend three months on a screenplay. I know people that spend 10 years on a screenplay. I know somebody who's actually under 30th year on the same script. I cannot imagine if that got ripped off, I mean, 30 years, think about it. So I tend to take things well, that I, I tend to take bad news well. So I didn't get all wrapped up in it. I, I just, okay, lesson learned, chalk it up as a life lesson and move on. Did you get any compensation for it, Shane? I never got compensated. I, there are three projects that I did that I created that got taken. Um, one was produced into a film that never came out. The other one went into pretty hardcore development at a major network with a big star attached. It never never did come. Um, there was another one that it was basically we had a pretty good timeline and proof that there was there was a ripoff. Um, and what was interesting is the 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 institution, the studio, whatever you want to call it, that did the ripping off had also optioned another project from us previously. So what they basically did is they took intellectual property that they had optioned from us and put it into another project, a storyline into another project that they already greenlit. Totally separate. They were going to make that anyway. They were hoping to make ours. Ours didn't really come to fruition, so they kind of grabbed some stuff and threw it in there. We hired the best of the best lawyers, and they were unbelievable in how they structured this case and their timelines. And at the end of the day, nobody wants to go to court. Nobody wants to sue anybody. I, I'm a firm believer in the blacklist. I know people, and I don't mean the script side. I'm talking about people saying we're not going to work with him because. And it, it just got to a point where, you know, other deals, other options were made. Hey, you know, so do you get paid for it? No. Sometimes if it's handled in a certain way, and I think, right, you could possibly... Uh, you could you could entertain another deal or two with a, with a with an in, an institution that would admit maybe they wronged you or were upset you felt wronged, you know, optioning another piece of property for two or three years isn't uncommon, I guess. Be play your cards right. Basically, what happened is they just said, "Look, you know, all right, we did what we did. You guys want to go through a lot. We're going to bankrupt you in lawsuits. It's going to take twelve years to. And just, well, do you have something else we can option?" And you know they're not going to make it, but you know, but that's how they do it. I mean, that's right. how that's how it worked on the third, on the first, on the studio one. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, they'll come up with creative ways to make you feel. Or hey, why don't we give you a development deal? No, we don't have to pay you anything. They just take a few gratuitous meetings with you over the course of two years, and you feel like you got yours. You know, interesting. It's it's weird.
you know, it's a, it's a deceptive business. And I think that's what's driven me. I'm, I don't, I don't ever want to thumb my nose at Hollywood proper. I've had a lot of success in it and thank God for it and hope to work again in it. I don't count on it. And then I don't care if I don't. I went real rogue independent in what I do because I just got tired of dealing with a machine. I got tired of developing, you know, fall in love with an idea, put it together, whether you've got $8 or $800,000 and go do it. What's stopping you? You know, I mean, the next film I'm doing, we're starting in, in a couple months. And it, it started because a group of us were sick and tired of sitting around during COVID. And we figured we can toss 2020 in the garbage bin like a lot of people are, or we can show something. We have something to show for it. And it was kind of like, we know two guys with two great cameras and a sound guy. We got actors that want to play. I got a great writer who's got a ton of material. I'll direct, produce, and cut the thing for free. I don't care. Let's make this year something. And then it turned into something where investors have gotten involved and better actors and bigger actors and crew. And now all of a sudden we have a real movie we're going to go make. And it happened because we just got sick and tired of sitting around and started putting things into motion. We never asked anybody for money. That was the last thing. We just wanted to get busy and have something to show for 2020. And the next thing you know, we're in full-blown pre-production on a show. You know? So I, I think I, I like that. There's no development. There's, let's do it. But how does a writer protect themselves from getting taken advantage of? Even though they have that, they, they really want that thing to pay off for them. Again, I think, I think the most important thing a writer can do is obviously you have to copyright your material and that includes the treatments, um, it includes the script, and I think you have to take, you have to take notes of where projects go. Um, you know, I look back at some of the projects that I had ripped off and if I had just taken better notes, just documented who, what, when, where, and why, I could have stopped them from being taken or at least gotten to partake in its success or failure from a producer or creator standpoint. And I just think it's too easy to, you know, be people when we're coming up, we want so bad to have our work accepted. We want to make it so bad, whether we're an actor or a writer. The problem is if you're an actor and you want to make it, you can audition and you can go out and meet people and do your thing. But your only calling card as a writer is to write. And unfortunately, everything starts with the script. You don't have an actor attached, you don't have a producer, a director, a set, financing until, well, what's the script? It's all about the script. So you're kind of kicking off the whole project. And the most valuable thing that somebody can take is a script. It's the only thing they can take. They can't take an actor. They can't take a director. They can't steal a craft service person. They're going to steal the script. So you have to really think that you're really the, the lifeblood of a project. You are the inception of the project. And what you have is gold to some people. So you have to protect it. You have to, you have to take as much time as you've taken to write your script. You have to think, I have to copyright it. I have to copyright every bit of intellectual property that surrounds it, whether it's your beat sheets, your breakdown, your, you know, your boards, whatever it is. You just, you gotta protect everything. And then you have to really, really be clear on who you've given it to, why you're giving it to. And I always say, be careful who you're giving it to. You know, Hungry writers, I, I can't tell you how often I hear, well, this, this producer reached out to me on, uh, you know, Facebook. And, uh, you know, they, they, I sent them three of my scripts. I never heard from them again. It's like, well, okay, did you look up who the producer was? Well, you know, he, he had this AC credit on a film two years ago. And, you know, look, if, if a real producer wants to work with you, they're not going to find you on Facebook usually. Now, I understand that is a way to find people, but... How did they find you on Facebook? Did they read something else you wrote and Facebook was the only way to find you? Or were they just trolling for people in the writing forums and the writing, you know, uh, what are they called? Uh, the writing forums of Facebook. And that's where a lot of these people get taken advantage of. It's really easy. All you have to do is DM one writer who's writing something on the board that you think is intelligent, gullible, vulnerable, and hungry enough. And just say, hey, uh, here's who I am. I'm interested in what you got. I'd love to read your work. And nine times out of nine, they're probably going to send it. You know, screen cap those conversations. Get this guy's name. Look him up. Start a file on everybody you send stuff to. You should have a file on every project and a file on everybody who sees whatever project you have. And that's a big way to protect yourself. A dossier. Is that what that is? <laughs> I, I've heard new words. I think words that's what like, the government does. What is there? There's the dossier, <laughs> and then there's the, uh, what's the other one? An op-ed. 
Oh, I've okay. heard these new words since the last four years. I never knew before. And in the reverse, how can someone who's been asked to read their script vet a producer? So seeing just like one credit on IMDb with no picture, no contact info, very little online presence, is that someone who you should really be sending your work to? I, I always think it's important for people to vet on the other side is, is, you know, we've talked about before, the easiest thing to do if you're a person who has a business card that says you're a producer but you haven't physically produced, uh, the easiest thing to do is go to something like Facebook and find a writer's form and find people that are, you know, all you have to do is join. It's free to join and you get to see the trends and habits and some of the idiosyncrasies of the people that are on that site. And you start realizing their vulnerabilities, their hopes, their fears, their concerns, and where they are careless. I find it amazing that people will actually say, here's my latest script and throw it on a Facebook forum. And you go, oh my God. Eric, I'll say, hey, I just did these 10 pages last night with love feedback. Okay. Um, you know, I think that's careless. Um, but, you know, producers are predatory uh, by nature. And sorry, but they are. They, you have something they want. So I think uh, you need to protect your work. I think you need to think twice before you just shotgun your material out. I think you need to look up people. I still, there's, there's a lot of writers that I respect that I know and I still try to collaborate with that'll say, oh, I heard from a producer. I sent this guy my work. He reached out to me and I'm looking at him. I go, have you even, oh no, I know he doesn't have an IMDb presence or he doesn't even have, but he's, you know, and it's like, not that IMDb is the, end all be all but good lord if somebody has got a history in the business of being legitimate that's certainly one way to vet them and i just it's mind-boggling how how often people don't uh take the time they don't want to hear the truth so they just they just shotgun it hoping that this could be the one and i think they have to be very careful hence you know getting your your projects ripped off several times over your career because you're not you know careful and I gave my projects to people that were real and legit, but I didn't protect myself. And they know when you don't. So even if someone's vetted, doesn't necessarily mean that you're safe. Just because somebody's vetted doesn't mean that you're safe. I mean, you know, um, easiest thing to do is to get a script that's not copywritten, um, then have the power to make something and get it from somebody who has no clout or juice or voice or word uh, in the industry. And if that's the case, then what, what do they have to stand on if they're not protected? You know? So what if someone says, well, then maybe I just shouldn't trust anybody. You then, shouldn't. Why even, then why even bother doing this? Well, you shouldn't. You shouldn't trust. Don't trust anybody. What you should do is protect your work, as we talked about before with the you know, United States Copyright Office. Don't waste your time with the WGA. Do it with the USCO. The same process, kinda, costs a little bit more, but it's it shows people that are in the know that you're serious. Um, it shows that you know how to protect your work and take copious notes and you should have a file on each project and you should have a file on everybody that you send it to. And that should be part of it and those correspondences. And if it's a phone call, take notes. I talked to Shane Stanley today, it's October 1st, 2020. He said he wanted me to send a synopsis emailed Shane Stanley at this email address, the synopsis for this story, waiting for a call back or a phone, you know, an email. And then when I email or phone back, print it out, put it in the file. And that way, if I go off and make that movie, I've got to, it's now the burden of proof is on me that I didn't rip them off. It's always on the writer to prove that I, that I ripped you off. But now all of a sudden, if you do your due diligence, it's now on me to show that I have to now provide all the stuff that I did to develop the material. And that's harder to do. Do you do this like in Excel or a Word pages? What I usually do is I have a backup email address. Like if I have my company account, whatever it is, .com, I have a Yahoo account that I don't access or give out to anybody. All it is is my overages. It's every time I email a project to somebody, I BCC it. And then that way I have it safe. And then when that person replies, I have a folder on my main of each project. So every time I get a hit, so I'm getting, I got the send out sent somewhere else, and then I've got the reply in a whole different other email mass. So that way, God forbid, one crashes, one goes blank or gets hacked, I at least have half the conversation somewhere. Right. That's how I do it. That's great. Yeah. 
We've imagined that you've received your share of screenplay pitches or you've heard about others pitching. What are some of the wrong ways to pitch? What are some of the wrong ways to reach out to someone? I think there is a right way and a wrong way to present people your work, your screenplays to approach them. I think if you break it down, I think writers need to be just as good, if not better, as writing a synopsis or a treatment. I like getting those two-page treatments where, you know, if it's five acts, it's a paragraph per act, a title, a log line, a brief synopsis, and then the breakdown. I think if you can do that and you can basically summarize what it is you're trying to say, I get, I can tell in two minutes that this is a story I want to read. I don't need to see a script. Um, but it's really important that you know the craft of, of, of writing too, because uh, writing is a gift, writing is a craft, and a lot of people don't understand the importance of good storytelling. And because they've spent a year and a half writing a script doesn't mean it's good. And they have to respect a lot of people get hit with so many scripts that they take it personally if you don't want to read it. And you know, we all have lives, we're busy. We have business life, personal life, social life. We have all these things in our own work life. And I always, you know, if somebody is kind, considerate, and they reach out, I always try to say, okay, well, I'll look at a synopsis, but only if it's copywritten. And you see the copyright, you know, registration receipt. I'm not ta- I don't take anything without that. Um, so make sure you have your work copywritten and be kind and considerate in realizing that you're, you know, you're, you're not the only person who has a script that needs read and reading a script does take people a couple of hours out of their day. And you know, how many people do you know that you don't know that would take two hours out of the day for a stranger to just read your script? So I just think it's about the presentation. It's about knowing how to write a synopsis or a treatment that can lure a reader or a decision maker to want to know more about what you're doing is really important. How often do you receive cold pitches? Uh, You know, it's not that often. Um, I get, I mean, I get a lot of inquiries, which I really appreciate. I don't mind people asking. I'm an open book. You know, anybody can email me, info at shanestanley.net. I mean, I don't care. It's how it's done. And it's, for me, um, when I just get an email that's shotgun, and I know it's shotgun, I don't even look at it. I just, you know, I just write back and say, I don't accept unsolicited material. And I CC my lawyer, I CC my manager, and I write them back. And I say, hey, you know, you sent this to me unsolicited. I am not interested in seeing this. This is not how to do it. Appreciate it if you have uh, somebody who, who reps you. If they want to reach out to my manager or lawyer, that's a different story. And I never hear back from them again. That's just the end of it. People who reach out genuinely, you know, because I do so much work with the colleges that, you know, I'll I'll encounter a writer three years ago and then they'll write, you know, and say, you know, dear Shane, you gave a workshop at my class in Florida a few years ago and, you know, I I finished a screenplay and I really enjoyed your, may I send it to you? I always write back and say, I'm not going to read your screenplay right now, but if you want to send me, you know, Copyright everything, I go through, you know, copyright everything, I need to see that it's been registered, certified, copywritten with the USCO. Once that's done, I will gladly look at a treatment and we can go from there. And usually they're pretty cool about it. I don't mind reading those. I don't. I'm not going to read scripts. I just don't have the time. And I know that's terribly heady to say, but I just don't. I'm a slow reader. Shane, what are the top five reasons you will reject a screenplay? Let's say it's, it's well written, it's formatted, but there's just something that's not working for you. You know, in rejecting a screenplay, the first thing, writers should never take it personally. Uh, Art is nothing but opinion. I mean, you think about how many great scripts got made years after the fact, after they were turned down and rejected by so many other filmmakers. Um, It's about, first and foremost, it's about the project connecting with the person you're sending it to. Just because I made a movie about football and had success with it doesn't mean I want to make another movie about football. I also want to evolve as a filmmaker. So what's important is is that you never take it personally. Um, I would hope if I do read a script and I think there's something there that I would at least write, I would always try to make it a point to write the writer or contact the writer and say, look, I gotta be honest with you, you're talented. I like what you're doing. I know somebody who I think would appreciate it. Let me help you. You know, I have no problem with that. And one of the writers that I work with who I, he's one of my favorites to work with is C.J. Wally. He's the, the guy that has Script Revolution out of the UK. And our relationship kicked off by reading one of his scripts that was beautifully done. I would never make the movie. I couldn't sell the movie. But it didn't mean he can't write. 
and I, I read his words, I read his the, his setups, I read his the, you know his character arcs, and it, I just and I read his theory on breaking down scripts and doing proper treatments and synopses, and I this guy had it all together, and for me it was like, hey dude, I love your writing. I have a project I'm going to do. I want you to write it, and then we were able to work together, and like you know we've written several scripts together, and that came because I read a script that I I would never make but I knew the writer was good. So it's not always about the script. I don't think spec scripts get made much anymore. Filmmakers have an idea what they want. We have actors that we know what they wanna do. We have buyers and sales agents who we know what they can sell at the moment. And we have an audience trend that, you know, right now doing a drama, living in an apartment is not gonna sell. We have all been locked in because of COVID for six months in our four walls. We want to be outside. We want to laugh. I don't want to hear about your problems. I don't want to think about my problems. So if we're selling scripts right now and you're trying to pitch, it better be adventure. It better be funny. It better have romance. It better get me out on the water. I want it to get me out in the desert. I want to go on travel. These are the things that you constantly have to think about. And writers don't. Writers are very myopic. And that's okay. We, we get in a box and it's all about this. And you have to realize there's there's actors, there's money that has to be raised, there's directors that have to come on board, there's um, teams of people that have to capture the vision to make this happen. And after all that's said and done is can it be sold? Are there those seven trailer moments in this script that we know we can sell it? Is there an, uh, an output worldwide or is this just gonna appeal to one place? And that's these are the things that a lot of writers don't think about, the business of the business. It's not just whether your script is good. So much of it is about where is it going to sell? You're still selling a widget. Are you selling a widget that only appeals to one out of every 5,000 people? Or are you selling a widget that everybody kind of needs? And that's how you have to look at it when making a script. And what are those seven trailer moments? I don't think they're anything specific. I think they're the catchphrases. They're those hero moments if you're telling an action story. Like take any two minute super trailer that you see. And you'll see those five to nine moments that you know are important in the film. They're the, they're the tent poles of the story. They're the catchphrases. They're that huge explosion. They're that great moment in the car chase. It's, it's the sex scene real quick. It's the action running. It's, it's those things. And they're not anything consistent, but your story has got to be able to tell the executives who don't read scripts and don't know much, um, it's got to tell them that I can sell this. That's all it is. It's can I sell it? Um, some of the, re the relationships I have with sales agents and buyers, they don't read the scripts. They want the synopsis. They want mock art. You know, they want to see a mock poster that me and a writer make and in two hours on Photoshop and say, here, here's your kind of idea for the image. Here's your here's your logline. Here's your title, and they'll tell you right then and there. Yeah, I can sell that. That's how these decisions are made. Wow. Yeah. So so what? why not even forget the treatment? Why not just come up with a great poster and, and a log line? Well, I think that's a bit, but you still have to have a script to shoot and finance. So ultimately, you're going to need the script. Um, but I think, I think that's all part of the package because so many people are from the filmmaker side. I don't write as much, but if I have a writer who's done a script, I expect the synopsis and the treatment to be as good, if not better than the script. It's got to be. Because I know there's, there's always three scripts, the one you write, the one you shoot, and the one you cut, okay? The treatment is what you're really selling overall. They, executives are not gonna read the script. I, I deal with more executives now, they just wanna see, they just want a two-page synopsis and just throw me some mock art so I know what I'm selling. And they'll tell you, well, tell me in five minutes, I can sell it or you're gonna find somebody else, I can't do anything with this, it's not my wheelhouse, okay. And then we make the decision, do we, do we believe in this enough to roll the dice and struggle and pull teeth and try to get it somewhere else? Or do we listen to people we trust and say, this is not the one to do? That's our developmental process. It's very quick. We don't go through the years of development or months. It's here's an idea. I'll pitch the idea to my buyers. If they like it, I say, okay, they like it. Let's do the synopsis. And then I get them the synopsis, sometimes with some mock art. And then they'll either say, okay, the idea is good. Act two, I can't, you can't do this in act two. This, this, I can't sell. Tweak it this way. And then they'll go, oh, you know, in act four, uh, can this happen? Maybe in act five, it's happening too soon. Or can you bring the villain in sooner? 
Those are the kind of conversations we have. And then it just, the table is set and the writer can go do it. And I, the, script, the, the spec script is very hard to sell. I think spec scripts are great calling cards if somebody can write or not. Found a tremendous writer through the community college just in this during COVID who I take a lot of pride in. I not only got her a manager, she got a job like writing a script for hire for a, a, a very substantial production company. And this is one of my Zoom students from the community colleges that reached out to me. You were asking the right way and wrong way. She reached out to me. She had taken three or four of my Zoom classes with the community college. Lovely woman, very articulate, kind, no expectations. Just, I really appreciate it. I would love to share my work with you. Here's where I want to go in my career. And she's, she's an older woman. She's like, you know, her son's like my age. I mean, she's been around and has worked around the industry, but never really flourished as a writer. And I finally said, let me look at one of your synopsis. I looked at it and went, oh my God, I know somebody who's looking for this. So I said, I'm not going to read your script. Send it to me. I'll, I'll send it to somebody who knows this company. And the guy read the script, called me up and goes, who is this woman? She's really good. And we got her an agent. And three weeks later, she actually got a work for hire on a greenlit film that they green, they had greenlit on the concept. And they liked her writing enough to say, you were, you were a writer for hire on this. And she's on her last, she's on her second polish on it and they're getting ready to go into production, I think in January. It's Greenland. Wow. How common is that? Not very. <laughs> but I say that to inspire uh, because there are ways. And again, it came from being kind. It came from being a familiar face. It came from somebody who, who reached out with a tender heart and a gracious heart to understand and respect my schedule. And maybe I didn't want to read it and understood when I said, I don't want to read your script. But let me let me look at the synopsis. And then when I was like, there's something here, I said, I'm gonna send the synopsis to somebody I think would like this. And if they do, I'm gonna need you to have a script ready. And that's how it went. Is synopsis king? In this day and age of instant information and being able to get answers quickly, I, I suggest that it is definitely something that is put to the forefront, uh, going back to people's time. And you know, we've developed this instant gratification generation of you know getting it on the phone and I'll get you an answer let me ask Siri I think a lot of us has put that into our workflow um, I know what my days are I I hit the ground I am working by 5 5 30 in the morning even when I'm not making a movie and my wife is usually saying all right honey come on it's getting late and you know this is when we're not doing a movie I just I'm immersed in my work so taking two hours a day to read a script it doesn't fit I don't schedule read days so my my feelings if you want to write and you want to get seen by filmmakers who are who are busy, and uh, I suggest you really learn how to build a treatment. Besides being a good screenwriter, learn how to do a treatment. Learn how to do a synopsis. Um, there is a uh, a web platform uh, based in the United Kingdom called Script Revolution. It was it was it was created by C.J. Wally, and I find if you're a writer, I suggest you go and check out. It's a free site. It's, 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 I think you will be blown away on the, the way it breaks down how to write not only screenplay, but the treatment, the synopsis, the act breakdowns. He's created some, you know, the turn and burn, which is this really cool theory. And I think once you understand that as a writer, your treatments are going to flourish, which are going to make people that are in a position of making movies get more excited about what it is you're doing and what you're trying to say. So I think the treatment and the synopsis is so important. The script ultimately is. But if I read a great synopsis and a great treatment, I will be more forgiving on the script knowing where ultimately this could go. Where if I just get a mediocre script and it's uh, okay and done, I don't see the vision that you caught me in in a page or two. So I'm a big proponent for the treatment. And sorry, just real quickly, what is the turn and burn? That's a good question. That's for him to answer. I mean, if you go, if you go on the website, if you go on to scriptrevolution.com, there is a whole subchapter about Turn and Burn, and it's his theory on how he creates the synopsis. And it's a whole, it's a whole map of like 10 different sayings that he has that I could never relay. I don't write anymore. But um, it all makes sense. And when I know when I've collaborated with him or other writers that are part of his platform. It's, it's, really, it's really about the developmenting the treatment. Develop the treatment so the script process is, is easy. It's like, as I talk about in my book, the most important thing about filmmaking is the pre-production time. 
I, I work myself to death during pre-production, so production is fun and easy. That's how it's supposed to be. You know, pro football players will tell you, you work Monday through Saturday and you get paid to play on Sunday. That's how it should be when you write. That's how it should be when you make a movie. And what they've done at Script Revolution is they have basically given you training camp, hell week, and practice in the treatment side. So the writing of the script is actually fast, efficient, and it's right on point, and there's no surprises. And that's what most filmmakers, development executives get concerned about is writers going down rabbit holes they weren't supposed to go down, going off track. If your treatment is in order, everything is it's expected. You're just filling up the pages with, with witty dialogue, with fun. I'll give you an example, we're working on this film. We developed, we've got a, we've got a six page treatment. That's the five acts, it's the character breakdown, who everybody is, what the point of the show is, what's the log line, what's the synopsis. We have gotten four acts in seven days. There's not been one surprise except happy surprises. Because we all know where this is, there's four of us that are involved in doing the film that are from a decision-making capacity. Not one of us have been thrown a bump, a roadblock, a, a speed bump. Nobody's been like, oh my God, what's going on? And it was because the way the treatment was handled going in. It's, it's, it is so paramount. And speaking of bumps, I don't know if you're reading my mind, but I was just going to bring up Goosebumps. It's so it's funny. That was the next serious. thing I was going to say. Was that uh, R.L. Stein, I guess, the creator of Goosebumps, he talked about how he knows the ending and he writes this treatment or whatever. And then once he knows the ending, then he can go back and he can fool the audience. And he, it's, it's effortless writing, but it's just getting that, yeah. that structure in place. And I, know, and I know in the way that they do these treatments, they often will have 17 blank pages and start on page 17 and work backwards. It's not uncommon. And it's interesting. And, and there's different ways for it to work for everybody, but it's kind of just basically a way to think about it. And I think once you capture that, whether you're a writer or not, you see what he's doing and you go, oh, I get it. And too many of us, and the way I used to write when I used to try to hack away was I would just sit there and come up with a title and write fade in and tell my story. Sometimes I got lucky and sold a few scripts. I did okay. But as I got older, um, my mind wasn't as fast, I wasn't as creative. I had kind of burned a lot of that creative energy telling stories and then becoming a filmmaker, an editor, a producer, a director, where I wasn't just sitting for weeks at a time writing. So I learned later in life how important a treatment is. It's, it's so important to know what it is you're gonna do. And it's great when you can surprise yourself as a writer, but to know where you're going, to know the purpose of each scene, to know the, the arcs and the backstories that aren't going to be on the page of each character. I think if you as a creator know all that, you'd be amazed the stories that you can tell. It's just, it's just smooth sailing. Shane, we've heard you say, send us treatment. We've heard on our side, people say, okay, I sent them a treatment. It was a 20 page treatment. Is that okay? Is that too long? Oh, I think in first pass, I think, I think you need to again, be considerate of the reader. Um, when I say send a treatment, I would like a title. I'd like to know who it was written by. I'd love to see a log line, and then I'd like to see a two-page synopsis. Give me a paragraph per act. That's it, that's all I need. And I could either say, yeah, I like this, I wanna see a script, or I could say, you know what, if you have a more in-depth treatment, breaking down some things, backstory on the characters, cast size, um, I'd love to see it. That 20, then I would expect that 10 to 12 to 20-page treatment. It's not that you shouldn't have them. I feel when I say you need to be versed as a writer in writing synopsises and treatments, those are two separate things that are equally as important. Because I'm only gonna read a synopsis first. I, I just wanna see a page or two on what you're doing. And if that instills not quite enough interest to see the script, but I'm intrigued enough to say I wanna know more, that's when that 20 page treatment or whatever it is that you've done is important. Obviously not a 90 page treatment, then just send me the script, but you know what I mean. It's, it's, I think the synopsis is king. It's, it's just let's, let's ignite that fire, spark the interest. And if you get that, have the treatment ready, but hopefully the script is there and, and tight, good. That was a great question. It is because some people send you like a paragraph and you're like, well, that's it? You know, I always say your synopsis should just be a paragraph per, you know, a treatment is a paragraph per act and then the breakdowns and everything, but a synopsis should be about a page and a half, two pages. And, and if you need more than that to tell the story, you gotta, you gotta relook at your story. It's too confusing, it's too, it's too long, it's too, you know, it's too hodgepodge, you gotta tighten it up. What if someone doesn't know the difference between a synopsis versus a treatment? 
I think a synopsis versus a treatment, uh, a good answer at least that, that I can give and, and what I see it as, a synopsis is usually a paragraph or two, you know, a thousand words or less is kind of, it's gonna tell me what this is. Now, a treatment usually is going to have a log line. It's going to have um, wh what the tonality is. It's going to have the purpose. It's going to have the message. And then it's going to give me five acts and it's a paragraph or if it's three acts, it's going to be a paragraph per act. And then it's going to talk about the characters. It's going to break them down as if you would see in an actor's breakdown. It's going to say, you know, uh, Karen, age 25, comes oh, from humble, <laughs> comes from humble beginnings, oh, loves cats, has got a wonderful <laughs> husband, you know. And those are the kind of things you don't see in a synopsis as much as, you know, Karen, mid thirties, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I just added 10 years. But <laughs> I think, I think a treatment is more a real breakdown of developmental notes, tonality, purpose, where this can go, and all the possibilities. Like one thing that they do in, in, in what Script Revolution teaches is um, alternative endings. I always like when they break something down for me, and I've got the five acts, I've got the tonality, I've got the this and that, and then all of a sudden it says alternative endings. And it says this first, what we went with, and then it gives four or five alternative endings that are completely different that still fit and why you could or couldn't use them. It's just really, to me, it's really fleshing out your story as a writer and giving people different, different perspectives of how it could go. You know, we've all heard about alternative endings and seen the fun DVD bonuses where this movie had three different endings. Like I understand Castaway had three different endings that they shot. Um, well, obviously those were written. And that was an option. It was something that was on the table. Well, the writer gave that gift to the filmmakers and the filmmakers ultimately decided to go with the one where he's at Four Corners and the welder who he left the package for came up and told him which way to go and she just went and we never know if he followed her or not. But there were three endings apparently. And uh, I'm sure that the treatment probably talked about those opportunities. Do you think you've run out of ideas? You said just, you know, as time's gone on, just you, you've told so many stories and you've, you've made so many films and things. Do you think someone runs out of ideas? Oh, I don't think, I would, I would hate to think people run out of ideas. If you have found a niche and you flourished in a niche and done the same style over and over and over again, I think you gotta be careful not to try to become a one trick pony. Um, I've done different kind of films in my career. I've done the dramas, I've done the rom-coms, I've done the actions, I've done the thrillers, I've done the suspense, I've done, you know. I enjoy the action thrillers a little bit more. I'm, uh, as I get older, I'm gearing more toward doing those, especially the female-driven action film is really where I'm focusing the next chapter of my life. Um, adventure, romance, you know, adventure romance stories are fun too. Um, I think what's important is to collaborate with people that inspire you. Um, I don't write anymore, but I know I'm good at, at ideas. And I know that from the writers that I collaborate with. They said, oh no, you've given me something. I can run with this. And that's all I'm responsible of. Is all I can say is, hey, here's, some, here's a story I want to tell. Does that do anything for you? And they either catch the vision or they don't. Um, I think every story's been told. It's how we tell it that makes it fresh, right? I mean, you know, everybody's seen mob movies, everybody's seen action movies, everybody's seen, you know, the Harry Met Sally knockoffs and the Scream knockoffs. I mean, it's all been done. What what twist are you gonna put in there? What what originality or flair are you gonna, what wrinkle are you gonna put in the story that's gonna make audiences engage and not feel that they've seen this over and over again? I think that's important. When you start thinking about the structure of a story, key beats, turning points, you know, I think um, I think you need to keep a reader engaged. I don't think there is a set time, but if you're, you know, 15, 18, 20, 25, 30 pages in and we still have no idea what's going on or there hasn't been that, you know, moment, I, I think you, you kind of need to rethink some things. Um, you know, there's the old saying, when you watch a movie, it's that 42 to 46 minute point that usually kind of becomes a slow burn no matter what the movie is. So I know a lot of writers and filmmakers try to make sure that point of the film doesn't lack a spark or an interest because that's a lot of times where people, they're not gonna give up on the film but they tend to get a little restless. 
it seems a lot of people take a really long time to get to the point. And I think, and I've learned that as a, as an independent filmmaker, when you sell your material, it's more about, you know, we have to remember this as a business. And nowadays with phones and tablets and distractions and pets and kids and everything else under the sun going on, we're constantly interrupted. Audiences, when they see your film, unless they're really at a movie theater and truly turn their phones off are never really 100% immersed in your story. There's always something. There's a noise outside. There's a cat knocking over a vase. It's a kid who's crying because he didn't get his way and he's hungry. And you know, you have to realize that as a filmmaker, what you're up against. And I think to just kind of lull along to tell your story, it's very rare that you're gonna be able to compete with anything. So I think to be able to throw some twists and turns, to engage your audience into some new layers or elements or characters, or what's the point of this movie a little sooner than we used to, I think is happening, needs to happen more often. And I think a lot of writers are starting to figure that out. So then you wouldn't be working some of this out in the treatment stage. It's once you actually start the actual screenwriting process. I've gotten to the point now when I work with writers, I tell them it's got to, you know, it's, it's sadly, um, there's kind of an 11 minute rule abroad that we kind of need to know what this is about and what's going on and what we're signing up for in the first 11 minutes of the actual movie, which is going to tell somebody that's got to happen in the first 12 to 15 pages of the script. Um, and I don't like telling stories that way, but I've also learned the hard way. I've had some, some projects that, you know, hey, if you do this, it'll sell. Hey, if you change this, it will, it will move. And what I've learned is the faster we get to the point in our storytelling, and I know this goes against everything from telling great stories of the old days, but we're living in a new time. And it has really gotten to be about get to the frickin' point. What am I signing up for early? They, they want to know. It's like, you know, I'll give you an example in the film that I just did that's coming out break even. It's about four kids who find $50 million while scuba diving at a remote island. And we developed this opening and this whole thing and this backstory and why are these kids here and who are they and what's their relationships? And it was basically, yeah, we need to find that $50 million by 12 minutes in. And it's like, well, wait a minute, that doesn't come in until page 30. Well, <laughs> it needs to come in about 12 minutes in. So you, you have to restructure some things. You have to cut scenes, you have to cut backstory because at the end of the day, when you're selling a movie around the world, they're signing up for something. And if you're selling an action film, if you're selling a thriller, if you're selling a suspense story, you better get to it because there's too much competition. There's too many things that are moving fast that'll hold attention because it moves so fast. That's where that MTV generation of cutting came from is we don't know how to tell a good story, so we're gonna cut a bunch of stuff really fast so you're afraid to take your eyes off the screen. And that has now become it's found its way, I think it's found a balance in storytelling with films a little better, but we need to get to the point. And if you look at the older films, uh, some of the, most of the ones that I grew up, you know, Chariots of Fire, The Black Stallion, you know, all these enchanting April, you're looking at like 25, 28, 35 minutes in until you really kind of have an idea. If you watch The Black Stallion, they don't in, in, introduce Mickey, Mickey uh, Rooney's character until about, I think, 48 minutes in. You know, the kids alone at the island for 30 minutes are crying out loud. Then he gets home and then he's got to reintegrate in school and then all of a sudden the horse runs away and then he goes on this trip to try to find the horse and then there's your co-star. And it was also that way with On Golden Pond. They didn't bring, you know, Jane Fonda in until 25 minutes in. So I don't think those play as much anymore. Um, not saying the films don't hold up as great cinema, but we want to meet the players. We want to know what the game is a lot quicker now. Or even the Stepford Wives, like, I mean, then, then that was the like the original. Well, the version. original one. Yeah, I mean, it's just it. long driving scenes with the music, the soundtrack, and yeah. there was something comforting about that. I don't Not know if today. that would work today. But. Well, you know, Quentin did it in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I think he really exploited the driving scenes. But we're looking at the back of Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio's head, so you know that makes it a little different. But sure. what I try to tell the independent filmmakers, if you're not getting Brad or Leo as your stars, and I don't even get them as my stars, um, your your international buyers want to get to the point, and we're at a point now where we you know we are able to lock picture, and we don't make different cuts for different markets or parts of the globe. We've kind of learned that what what works comfortably everywhere. You know, there's 54 territories that we sell to around the globe, 100, what is it, 170 countries. And in that, you, you have 54 territories. And 
you want to try to do something that's going to appeal to everybody. And it's hard to please all the people all the time, but getting to the point quickly is one that you can really help sell that movie a lot better if people know what they're signing up for in the first 15, 20 minutes, tops. Well, it's interesting because people seem to get upset when we say that, or we interview people and they say, you know, if a script isn't good by 10 pages in, most people will stop reading it. And so then the comments are, well, you're not giving it a chance. Right. People just don't have the patience anymore. You know, again, I, I hate to revert to it. You go back to it. I mean, look at Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Brilliant film. That is a slow burn. I think if that movie was made today, that would be a lot different. Not taking anything away from Stephen, who did a great job writing the script. It was based on an experience he had as a kid. Right and a great job directing it, but you're gonna tell me that movie today would play at that pace? I don't think so. And you're right, a lot of people say, well, you're not giving it a chance, and most readers will say, God, if it doesn't get me by page eight, I'm done. I think you kinda have to, you know, the executives, you know, there was a trend where all the executives were saying, you gotta find that hook, it's gotta be edgy, you know, I want it to be edgy and grab me, you know, shake me by my, by my lapels by page eight, you know? And so everybody came up with the edgy, crazy opening that just shocked everybody. I don't, think, I don't think shock and awe is what make people watch a whole movie. People want to be drawn in. They want to care about characters. They want to go along for a journey and they know what they're signing up for. But you have to make that journey interesting. You want to put some bends in the road. You want to have some interesting things that they're going to pass. And I think you need to occasionally give them a flat tire, throw a rod in the engine. They're going to have to get out, grab their bags, hitchhike, find a ride. You know, I think I just think that's where we are now. People are just so bored. I mean, you look at Twitter. Twitter has an auto feed now. I don't even. I, I can't even go on it anymore because the second I try to read what somebody tweeted, it automatically scrolls, and I can't find the tweet I was reading. And there's no way to stop that. That's just how we are getting our information now. And there's we got to find a balance in storytelling, but that is kind of what what's working right now, and it's frustrating. It's a hard pace to keep up with. How do you write good dialogue? I think the best dialogue comes from the best listeners. Um, I had a, an absolute crash course in writing dialogue. Years ago, I, I used to write with Charlie Sheen. Um, I don't care if they don't credit him in the sitcoms he's been in as a writer. I know who's been writing the dialogue. I worked with him for three years. I, I never read or heard better dialogue from anybody than that came from him that he wrote. Um, and I asked him one day, uh, I used to be really good at writing scene direction. My dialogue was flat. It wasn't interesting. It wasn't engaging. It wasn't edge of your seat. And I asked him one day when we were writing, um, the way we worked is we'd set it up and I would write the scene direction and he would do the dialogue unless, you know, it was some basic stuff. It was easy. And I finally said to him, I said, where do you get this encyclopedia of incredible dialogue? I I've never heard anybody with it before. And he said, you just listen. He said, you know, when this was working, these aren't working. And if these aren't working, you can't absorb what's happening and how people interact and find those gems. He said, most, most of the things that I write that people like, I heard at a party, I heard at a barbecue, I heard at an airport, I heard while I was pumping gas. He said, you know, I'll get out and pump gas and I'll hear a couple bickering in the car next to me at the pump. And he said, that's gold. He goes, that is gold, man. He said, you know, and this is before everybody had phones. So we, were, we weren't listening to them. We were doing this. So I find the best, the best advice to writing a dialogue is listen. Put yourself in a character's position that you've created. You know, it goes back to the old, um, I think, keeping an audience interested in good dialogue. I think also the problem is a lot of people try to outwit themselves with dialogue. They, they think they got to use verbiage or words that people don't use. They, they gotta show you how smart they are. I think we've talked about it before. It's like the drummer that overplays everything to show, look how good my chops are. And it's not about that. It's, it's, about, it's about making things sound organic. And that's a lot of things that the actors have to understand too is you know, they're acting or are they truly listening and responding with the work. Um, but I think the best dialogue comes from the best listeners and the people that know how to implement those words that they've discovered over the years in new, in new arenas. I mean, obviously you're not gonna be pumping gas at a gas station and hear a husband and wife. Every script you write is not gonna be about a husband and wife pumping gas at a gas station. So where else can you implement that? Could that be 
a film like Sahara, where Matthew McConaughey and Penelope Cruz are walking across the desert, or you can put some of that bickering in in different situations, but it's, it's how you use it, and how it inspires you to go down different paths. Um, that's how I've, I, I learned from him to, to write better dialogue. I'm still not very good, but I know, I, I know good dialogue when I hear it, and I'm good at adjusting dialogue when I get it, and I, I, it's about listening. And now people are on phones, so you could just hear one side. You of only dialogue. hear one side. And I don't think people realize or they care how well you can hear them and how dialed in everybody, no pun intended, to the people are to what, I mean, I've heard some major arguments, major personal, th and I'm like, I don't think this person realizes I can hear them halfway across the store, but that's gold too. It's gold and it's even better when they're when they're on speakerphone so you do get to hear all of it or their the receiver's up so loud. But you're right. I mean, sometimes you'll hear one half of the conversation and sometimes that can be better because you're able to imagine I mean, can you imagine if it was hey Harold, you didn't take the trash barrels in and that's what the whole fight's about, but you're only hearing Harold's side. Can you imagine what you can create Maud is yelling to him about? I mean, when you were working uh, at the car lot, mm. did it did you pick up anything about dialogue? I realize that's not why you were there, but if I'm coming to look at a car, you know, I'm probably going to be hesitant. I'm probably going to be like, I don't want this guy to sell me anything, but I do need a car, but I don't want to let him know that. Sure, sure. So I'm going to be very selective with what I say. Um, I learned, um, as I said, when the owner of, of Galpin had said, come sell cars, he said, you'll learn more about life than you've ever known, and it'll be the education that you lacked. He wasn't, he wasn't kidding. Um, you become a good listener because you have to overcome all objectives. You have to address every concern and need that a customer has. So how does that happen? It happens by listening. And I always, I, it wasn't dialogue lines. I don't think, in, and I have a very retentive memory. If I hear something, I remember it. Um, there wasn't anything said in those 18 months I worked there that stood out, but it was mannerisms, it was quirks, it was character flaws or, or neat things about people that I, that I still to this day will implement in my characters. Um, the way a husband and wife interact, it's not about what's said, it's about how it's said. It's about the posture. It's about, um, the the 45 year old son who's with the 70 year old parents buying the ford Taurus today and you realize the parents have a gambling addiction they're getting a car to drive to vegas every other week but the 45 year old son still lives at home to help supplement the the overhead so they can afford to maintain their lifestyle and the kid's kind of a deadbeat too i mean there's all sorts of and then you look at that and you go wow that's that's a story you know you got this retired this retired milkman and his wife who ran a salon and now they are addicted to going to Vegas every, well, what else are they doing when they go to Vegas that we don't know about, you know? And then your minds are, what do they see on that trip to Vegas? Um, you know, it's the, the lotto winners. I sold, I sold to a few lotto winners. That was interesting. I actually had a salesman I worked with who had won $24 million in the big lotto and he left his wife and Two and a half years later, he was at the point selling cars with me. And you want to talk about like having it all and losing it. And, you know, friends who abandoned him when the money was gone. And he said, yeah, you know, it's funny. My wife still has her 10 million, you know, and here I am selling cars, trying to make, trying to make a living, living in a one bedroom apartment, you know, and he was the one who left her and was horrible to her. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you see a whole bunch of really interesting people. Um, but that two years, sorry to interrupt, no. but that two years was probably very fascinating. It was fascinating. Uh, as I said, I'm still very close to the family that, that gifted me that opportunity, the Bachmans. I am still very close to some of the salesmen that I worked with a lot. You know, sadly, some of them have perished. Um, you know, some of the people that were in that sales class I took, Patrick Wellman just died six months ago, I found out. And Stuart Sank, who sold with me, and I got the most character stories out of the, anybody in the world past. Uh, these were people I worked with and I, I was very close to. And um, it was amazing, uh, just the people, the experiences, the, the encounters of just walking out having a cigarette and encountering a guy whose car is in for an oil change and that 20 minute exchange you have with this guy. Those conversations will live with you forever, but you don't have to sell cars to do it. You can, you can drive an Uber, you can work at a restaurant as a waiter, you can work anywhere. Most of the encounters that I've had in my life that I write about are about 
personal experiences or exchanges or encounters that I've had anywhere. But it's funny you bring up the car years because that was my job five, six days a week. I'd spent those eight to 12 hours a day at the dealership dealing with no two days were ever the same. Fighting between, you know, salesmen for a customer or a customer, you know, there's an old saying in buying cars, it's all buyers or liars. And it was about trying to, I learned something. Um, we used to have a salesman there that sold ungodly amounts of cars and made ungodly amounts of money. And I used to say to him, what's your secret? And he says, you just got to remember all buyers are liars. And they're telling you one thing because they think they can have an edge. And the secret to successfully selling cars is giving buyers, they got to trust you. They got to like you and want to deal with you. But he said, you have to let them think they have control, but they really don't have an ounce of it. And it's almost like being a film director. Actors love to be directed and controlled, but they also like to think that they they're the show they're the and as a, a good director will help steer them and let them think that they can run with it and you got to be able to rein them in without them knowing you're being reined in it's, it's an art it's a dance and it's that way selling cars um but it taught me how to negotiate um selling cars and negotiating four five six times a day sure taught me how to go out and raise money sure taught me how to negotiate with contracts and actors and agents it's the same thing how much for how much right so that's a st everybody should go sell cars and you'll become a better filmmaker. <laughs> What's the best screenplay someone's ever submitted to you? Best screenplay somebody's ever submitted to me. Wow. Um, I've been fortunate to read some good ones. I mean, um, you know, I got a script. I got a script called Chase the Sunset. Uh, from C.J. Wally years ago, that, that that's what turned me on to work with him. It was just, again, it was a film I couldn't really make, but it was just, it was just really good. And then I was sent a script uh, by Nicole Fair, Fairbrother um, a while back, and it was a love story called The One, and it was just a beautiful, pure coming of age story for a married woman who realized she had she was in a, in a situation that wasn't healthy. It wasn't an abusive relationship. It was a loving marriage. It was a complacent marriage. But it was a dream of hers to be a writer and she wanted to put a toe in the water in the writing world and how her writing was accepted and the doors that opened to her. And it was told from a woman's point of view. It was just a beautiful story and it was, you know, Occasionally you find these gems that come your way that you don't expect. They're happy surprises where you, you read it and you say, God, someday it would be great to have the power to just give everybody the middle finger and make it. And who cares if it should or couldn't be done? And when I say it can't be done or I couldn't do it, it's because we have people that we're beholden to that write checks to make movies. They expect films that are going to be marketed and marketable and going to... Uh, work in certain markets that pay a certain amount and you just know sometimes reading a script this is not going to work but boy it's a, you know sometimes you try to work with the writer and say can we you know, finagle it a little here and finagle it a little, little there and see if we can and sometimes the writers are so hell-bent on the vision of the story uh they say no and they say i don't care if it never gets made i it's going to stay the way it is or never get made and i i have a lot of respect for that i really do um those those two were real special when you say give the middle finger, and I realize you're just using this metaphor, but what does that entail? Like, what does it really mean? Are, are you really, are there people actively stopping the production or? No, what it means is, is, you know, I'm very fortunate. I, I work with backers who don't read scripts. They don't know or care who's in them. They don't ask. Um, it's usually a synopsis, a page, a paragraph. This is what it's about. Here's some teaser artwork to kind of give you an idea of the world. And we'll usually just Photoshop a one sheet and say, this is the idea, this is it. How much do you need? This much, okay. And they trust me and know that this is something that'll sell around the globe and that they're gonna, they're gonna make their investment back, hopefully plus, and it makes sense. Um, when I say give the middle finger, giving the middle finger would be knowing I'm asking an investor to sign up for something that the chances are very slim they're gonna see their money back because it's not a marketable product. And also knowing that my sales reps, fortunately we have a good relationship, they'll take it on, but I know I've kneecapped them because I've given them this as a story to sell. You know what I mean? There's, there's that, well, you know, 
okay, well, you're going to kill half the territories. You're not going to buy it. And instead of getting $50,000 for a three-year license in, in Spain, they're going to give you $8,000 for five years. Is that really what you want? Well, that's not fair to your investor. But hey, it's art. And you know, when I say to give the middle, it would be nice to be in a position where I don't care. I'll write the check. Or I have an investor. We've had so much success. They're begging for a loss. Maybe this is the one, you know. And that does happen. It's 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 hard. Nobody wants to go in to fail. But there are some stories that are some of the best scripts I've ever written. And it doesn't matter who stars in them, or how who does them. You just know that this is not a marketable product. But God, it's good. It's a story that needs to be told. And especially when you come out of something like COVID, um, we've all we don't as we talked about. We don't want drama right now. Dramas are tough sells abroad. You know, they're really tough. And they're tough anyway, but right now they're extra tough. So, but the best, the best scripts I've written are drama. Or I'm, dramas are tough to sell because of everything. You know, we've experienced, especially now. They're they're especially they're especially tough. But I tell you, the best scripts I've ever read are dramas. Would you consider making a feature length film for ten thousand dollars right now? I've made a feature length film for ten thousand dollars. I've made a, a forty eight minute pilot for five hundred dollars. Uh, budget's never an issue for me. Um, I think we talked about recently uh, coming out of this year and what a horrible disappointment it's been. I think for everybody, um, licking our wounds. You know the great losses we've had. I think it sadly started with Kobe and then Neil Pert from Rush, and then just went into COVID and just crashed and burned and just kept burning. Um, uh, yeah, we're at that point where I think the next one, uh, just to keep the risk factor down and just to get out and shake the dust off. I mean, we're not going to spend ten grand, but we're going to keep the budget low and go out and have some fun. I would do something for ten grand tomorrow. Absolutely, I would. I hope I elaborated on that. And I just, it's a yes or no. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's where, you know, that's where I started. You know, my first, my first short was. I was told I'd have $25,000 to make it. And by the time we rolled camera, I had five grand, you know. What happened to the rest of the money? Oh, you know, bullshit. <laughs> you know, oh, I got 25 grand. I'll give you 25 grand. Let's go make this. And well, I've got five. <laughs> okay. So is that your litmus? If they tell you to, to subtract, what, like 70% or something? I don't work that way anymore. I was young and it was my first director, director job. And, you know, I had a script and it was with uh, a group of people I wanted to work with. And somebody came to me and said, I want to finance, you know, one of your projects. And I was like, great. And they said, I'll give you 25 grand. And to me, that was a lot of money. I knew what I could do with 25 grand. And uh, we, we went the first day and I was told after we were two hours in, oh, by the way, I was only able to come up with five grand. Oh. I still gave them the same film they would have gotten for 25, but you know, I still got an Academy Award nominated actor. <laughs> That's but great. Did it for five, yeah. So I'm, I'm all for those no budget films. I love it. I love what, it. What's the lowest budget you would consider? I, I never consider a budget. I To me, look, you're either going to get paid or you're not. I don't do shorts because they take as much time and energy. They just, they're just they just longer on the screen. You still have to pre-produce them. You still have to cast them. You still have to hire a crew. You still have to feed people. You still have to get locations. You still have to put gas in cars. So, you know, the first, the first thing I ever did, I did a 46-minute pilot for 500 bucks and... Somebody came to me once and said, you did that for $500. It's 48 minutes. Why don't you make a 90-minute movie for $1,000? And I wound up getting like 10, I think 10 or 12 to do it. But we did it. And it was fun. And, um, you know, you grow. I mean, you, you make your projects to grow. But sometimes the right thing comes along. And when you get to the point you are in my life where, where I'm at, it's you're, either, you're going to make money doing this or you're not. Are you doing it for the money? Don't do them. If you're doing them because you want to stay relevant, you're doing it because you want to keep the muscles tone, because you believe in something or someone, or you just want to, like right now, we've been indoors for five and a half months. I, I'll go pay to work right now. I mean, I just want to get out of the house and yell action and cut and argue with an actor and yell at a DP about something or a PA for wearing a red shirt on a sh I, mean, I don't care. <laughs> you know, for me, it's just, I mean, I've, I've literally been sitting on my ass for five and a half months. Now, we've been very productive. But I still have been sitting on my ass for five and a half months. So do I want to sit at home and not make money? Or do I want to go out and have some fun with people I care about and create 
and have something to show for the year. So there's there's no limits on budget or any of that for me. It's just go, you know, how much you got? What do you want to make? Let's do it. That's how I work. What are some of the things that independent filmmakers skip over thinking, oh, I don't need to spend a lot of money on that, but actually that's dangerous for them to do that? You know, I always say there's five things that really make a film look low or no budget. And it's, it's cinematography, it's the sound, it's the actors you choose, it's the editing, and it's the locations. And if you can step up in those five arenas and get the best that you can, and then really try to get better, you're gonna, you're gonna have a project that is just a step above. You know, I spent a lot of years judging different film festivals, um, obviously the workshops and things that I do with different schools, so I, I see it all. And when you start a film and it's shot just so bad, and there's no thought to framing or composition or anything, it's, it's just you're done. And the sound, it's bad sound is, is so easy to get. And it's one of those things that I, I watch more people chintz on and getting a good sound, uh, sound recording uh, on the set. Everybody likes to use their friends and lovers in their movies. Chances are your friends and lovers are not good actors. There are so many film schools. There are so many acting classes that you can call and say, I'm doing a student project. I'm doing a spec film. I want actors that are good and know their craft. And you know what? They will sign up to do it because they need tape. You, you ask your girlfriend or your friends either because you're afraid to ask real talent and they may not like your work or want to do it and that's where you're wrong. Or B, because you're afraid your girlfriend will leave you if you don't put her in your movie. And that's, you know, I write, I write about that in the book. Um, it's a kiss of death. I mean, if your girlfriend's a good actor, give her a role. But I would be very careful in, in casting. And editorial is important. Um, you know, editing is everything. I, I spent many years in the edit bay before I considered myself a filmmaker. And I, I learned what not to do in the edit bay. And it really, it makes me sad when people I think about is writing or their, their, their cinematography reel or, you know, the end result without thinking about the most important result in the filmmaking process, which is really the editorial and also the cinematography. I think they work very much hand in hand. Locations are key because anybody can shoot in their house, anybody can shoot in their kitchen, anybody can shoot in their car. Our job as storytellers is to take people places where they can't go, where they wish to go, or where they're afraid to go. And if you give them locations that are just, you know, interesting and break, break the monotony of every other low budget film, I think you'd be surprised how much more success you can have with your film. You know, I, I had a wonderful drama teacher and I, I, I always quote him, Mr. Kilpatrick uh, from high school. And his favorite saying was come up with three ways to do something and go with the fourth. And I wish I remember that more often. I'd probably have better movies that were more successful I, if I did. But especially young filmmakers, you know, hey, I can shoot this at, at my house. Okay, scrap that. There's one idea. You're not doing it. I can shoot it in my garage. Okay, that's even worse. It's still at the house, but no, you're not going to do it. I can shoot it in a car. Why? You know, does, I'm all for keeping dialogue scenes moving, so putting them in a car is a good way to do that. But where can you do this that's different, that's just going to make the viewer feel like they're watching something fresh? And I think locations are key. The most important thing is um, you know where people put money where they shouldn't is it seems to be the rap parties. I, I'm, a, I'm a big anti-rap party guy. Um, it's just money that's never going on the screen. It's money that you're more interested in the social media aspect of people cooing over your, your, you know, your rap party. And I think it's important to have a gathering of the people that have worked hard for the film, but do it smart. It's like when we do a film, we try to schedule our biggest cast days on the last day and something centrally located so people who aren't involved in the last day can come visit the last day. And we'll spend a little extra money on the catering. We may go and buy 10 bottles of champagne for the day, not expensive ones, but, and put a simple day for the last day so we can end early, no stress, and then party right there. We don't need to go rent out bowling alleys. We don't need to go rent out, you know, all these places. It's just money that doesn't go on the screen. And when you're making especially independent films, every dime counts. Why are you gonna blow it in one night that's never gonna go on the screen? Think about it. I know people that have spent 25 grand on a film and they'll spend five grand on a rap party. And I'll watch the film and say, why didn't you get a real editor? We couldn't afford one, really. You know, 
You could have gotten so-and-so for three grand to do that. Look at so-and-so's resume. Oh, they've cut 15 studio films that went number one. They've cut 18 sitcoms that are like top tier sitcoms that on their off time will happily moonlight and gladly get involved and get their hands dirty for fun for a little money. Um, and that's always the excuse. Well, we couldn't afford it, but it's always something else that they can afford that just doesn't matter. And I think they just have to reprioritize. Sadly, I think social media has become the driving force behind what people do. I Look, I know when I'm shooting a movie, 18 months later when the movie comes out, nobody's gonna care about our set pitch. Look, people wanna post on Instagram and Facebook, hey, we're on set, look at us, great. It's not gonna sell one ticket, it's not gonna sell one DVD, it's not gonna get one download. It's about how you build up to the end and its release. And there's something you don't wanna give is, you know, you don't wanna give people overexposure. You don't wanna make people punch drunk on your pictures of the same, same, same with no results or no output. You know, so we try to be very careful when we promote our films and not do it for years of social media hype and, and likes. It's, it doesn't sell any movies. It's not going to work. I want to go back to something that you said that was really interesting. You said you wrote about it in your book, and that is using a girlfriend. You could also fill in boyfriend, family member, coworker, cousin, right, <laughs> whoever. Um, and how do you have that conversation with that person? Because you know you want to keep the relationship with the person, or maybe you don't, but let's suppose you do want to keep the relationship. How do you say, listen, do you audition them the way everyone else does? I think it's a lose-lose. I, I say if you're a young filmmaker, don't date an actor. <laughs> I'm married to an actor, um, and we have a great relationship. You know, she did four years on General Hospital. She's been in a lot of fun movies, and there's never, it's like for me, I always try to put my wife in and, and just have her there to be involved. But she produces with me. She's involved in a post -pray. We work on a film together for eight to 12 months. It, having her be a part of it on camera is something I like to let her flex that muscle and have fun and she's good. She knows her craft, she's good at what she does. But she doesn't have expectations for me either. She understands it's a business. I don't like having her in front of the camera as a director. I just, I, I, I am not as gracious with her as I probably could be. I could be better as a husband to a wife who's acting. Um, and that's just probably my fault. It's just, you know, I, I just, it's not a dynamic that I love, but we found a way to make it work. And she's been in every film I've done over the last 15, 20 years and it's work. But um, to get back to your question, I think you have to decide, are you in this to showcase a whole bunch of friends or are you here to make a career? And if you're gonna become a doctor, you're gonna become an architect, if you're gonna become a lawyer, are you gonna spend all those years in college and bring your friends along with you while you're studying, taking your tests and learning the craft of medicine? I don't think so. So I think filmmaking communities are important and yes, relationships build. You're gonna meet women in film school or actors on the set that you're gonna fall in love with. But I think you really have to think above the shoulders and think what is, what is the purpose of this project and what do I hope to gain out of it and selfishly you have to build what's best for the project. There's nothing harder than when you've got somebody you love who's in front of the camera that is just atrocious and they just sink the ship. What I always try to do coming up is I would, I would find ways to utilize people's gifts in ways that wouldn't sink the ship. You know, I always say to somebody, well, you wanna work in the industry anyway. If you weren't gonna act, what else would you wanna do? Well, you know, well, why don't you produce this with me? I need somebody to handle SAG paperwork. I need somebody to handle our locations. And then you know what? Throw them an under five. Throw them something expendable where if God forbid it's awful, get rid of it. And I'm sorry to talk so, so straight. The only way to get rid of a problem is to not have a problem or to be able to get yourself out of a problem. And if you know, you're know you starring your girlfriend who can't remember a line or hit a mark or understand the, the craft of the, the respect the craft of acting enough to know it, why are you wasting your time? It just doesn't make sense. I, I don't have much much uh, um, grace or uh, I'm not very soft hearted when it comes to that. I say just don't even don't even go there. Yeah, I, I think it's not just girlfriends though. I think if there's friendships that are built around you know people whatever it is being in films together and, whatever it and is. that's great and it, I think it could just be a really difficult thing for people to handle. Yeah, I mean, Ed Burns was very lucky with Brothers McMullen. I mean, he had some very talented friends. True. Very but, true. I mean, you know, that happens once in a while. Shane Black, you know, he grew up at that, you know, coming off Overland in West LA, and he kind of lived in that famous house with writers and actors and storytellers, and these guys all kind of helped each other out and built the machine. It's very rare. 
Uh, you know the the Wilson brothers, Owen and um, and the other one. God, I'm blanking. Luke. Luke. Yeah, I mean, talented, and they ran, you know, did bottle rockets and all their friends. And there's ways to do it. Napoleon Dynamite did it too. But by and large, you know, you think about how many young filmmakers are out there, and we always go for, hey, mom, do you want to play the mom in my short? <laughs> You know, when you were Steven Spielberg in seven, that worked. But when you're in film school, you're trying to make a career for yourself. You know, again, call the acting schools. You know, there are a lot of acting schools that have some decent, talented people that would sure love to be a part of your film. And they will take it seriously and they will learn the learn the role and the craft is there and the talent is there. And, you know, Uncle Vinny playing dad is not always the best idea. You know, it's just, it, you know, I mean, now look. I'll often use an owner of a location if I know they're a SAG actor and they're good. Like I have, I have friends that own locations that are actually working good actors. I'll say, hey, I'll trade you off. I want your location, but I'll give you, I'll give you a few lines in this movie. Like, oh yeah, sign me up. But they're working actors also, you know. So I think you always have to try to put the right people in when you can. With the exception of with locals in certain films, especially if it's like a certain region of the U.S. or or other part of the world, there's just people that you just can't you can't get that from central casting. It's no. too good, no. you know. And and you can you can definitely tell, but it works in the film, you know. So we we're talking about getting some uh, some people that you just you just find just the gems. Oh, it, it's you know casting is it's interesting. I say. As filmmakers, you want to make friends with a lot of different agencies. Uh, to this day, I will I will reach out to friends that own boutique agencies you've never heard of, and say, "I'm doing a film. I need a cashier at a country store. I need a hipster who can play guitar at a campfire. I need somebody who can, you know, be a drug dealer on the corner, or I'll call a drug dealer on the corner and say, "Hey, you want to play yourself in a movie? I'll give you fifty bucks." You know, I mean, sometimes you got to do that. Um, I find the people that are the best to get are the people that do what it is you want them to do. If you're not hiring an actor, again, to me, it's always about getting the best person you can in front of and behind the camera. So if you need something and you're not getting it with what you're auditioning, go find somebody who does it and tell them, I just need you to be yourself. I want you to be a part of this. I'm not going to embarrass you. I just, I need, and you'd be amazed. I mean, I learned that from my dad. You know, we worked with probated youth for a lot of years and we had a lot of, of kids in our life that we knew that had done a lot of crooked stuff. And I remember one time we got a, a pilot um, for, uh, I think it was Time Warner Television or Warner Cable, Court TV, something like that. And they wanted a bunch of reenactments of burglaries and assaults and all that. And at the end of the day, we ended up, I think, hiring eight or nine of the kids that we worked with that had done time in real prison to play parts. And they did better than anybody. They knocked it out of the park because it's who they were. I mean, look at Homeboy's Industry Inc. Is that Father Boyle? Yeah, I mean, you got Father Boyle at Homeboy Industries. I mean, we I first learned about them when we were shooting Gridiron Gang. Half the extras you walk around, you go, you, you just know when you've worked around real inmates most of your life, like I have, the, the swagger, the way they walk, the way they talk, the way they move. And I remember saying at one point, I said, where, where'd we get all these guys? Because I know they've done time. I said, oh, this great thing going on called Homeboy Industries Inc. You gotta check it out. All these kids have done time. And I was like, that that makes sense. That's so cool. And so I'm a big fan of that. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, there's nothing worse when someone is supposed to play someone in the underworld, let's say, and Jeez. they're so squeaky clean and it just takes you out. And and there are, there are these there's mannerisms, there's just different signs. And yeah. Like, uh, watch a lot of music videos from the eighties because they would put a lot of the rock stars' girlfriends in when they were supposed to be down and out homeless girls, and you'd see these like, not Tawny Katane on the Jaguar hood, but you know, you would see supermodels literally with like shoe polish on their face digging through a, a you know, a, a bin looking for food, and you're like, oh, come on, man. Yeah. When you worked with Dwayne Johnson in, was it 2006 on the Gridiron Gang? Yeah. Did you have any idea he would be the star that he is today? Well, I'm not surprised that he became the star that he is today. Um, the guy is, he, he goes in 150% on everything he does. He doesn't do anything half cocked. Um, his commitment to excellence, I think it comes from his upbringing. Uh, and also his, you know, he was an accomplished football player in college, uh, played with the national champion, uh, team with the Miami hurricanes. And then obviously the, what he accomplished as a wrestler and his humble beginnings. And if you know anything about him, you know, 
huge disappointments going through football, the NFL, and the CFL, and then having to start and beg Vince McMahon for a job at you know these hundred and fifty dollar a night barnyard wrestling tours that they were doing, and you look at where he truly came from and and just his passion, his devotion, and his his commitment to learning the craft and making it as good as I think I think there are those few people that you say he can accomplish anything he wants. I, I think that's somebody I'd put at the top of the list. Absolutely. Do you remember anything notable from being on set with Dwayne Johnson? Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, you know, it was a memorable time. And fortunately, I, you know, proud to say that we remained good friends. Um, you know, here we are 14 years later. Um, still can call him a friend. Still in touch. He's, you know, as I said, he his commitment to excellence is second to none. He takes so much pride. You, know, you ever talk about somebody who... When they talked to anybody, it didn't matter if it was the guy who was cleaning the toilets, it didn't matter if it was an extra, it didn't matter if it was the director or me, producer or anybody. When he, when he talked to you, he was there 100%. It, it was all about this moment with that whoever he talked to. And I think the most memorable time for me when we were making the film was we were about two or three weeks in. We were shooting uh, during the summer. It was probably May or June. And we were shooting up at the prison in Malibu, where we actually, my father and I shot the documentary. We went back and shot the, the scripted piece with Dwayne there. And he got really sick. He got a flu, something, we don't know if it was food poisoning or what, but something, something happened. And, you know, it was one of those things, you know, the medics were called, you know, just, it wasn't, he was, it was just, you know, you're star sick. You get the medic there, you have a medic on set, and they were checking his, his, his blood, and it's this and that. And, and it was like, first thing he was going to say is, look, you know, we're here for three months, dude. You want to call? He said, no, 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 no. I got this. He goes, I just need, I need 10 minutes. Let me just, give me 10 minutes. Let me, let me hydrate. Let me let some of the aspirin kick in. Let me, we'll do this. And what was interesting, it was his first real deep scene with one of the kids where he was interacting with one of the kids from the program. And I don't know if anybody remembers the film. It's a scene where he uh, encounters the, the Samoan running back, Junior, in the middle of the yard at night. The kid had a call because it was his daughter's birthday and he was pissed that he was missing his birthday. And Dwayne wouldn't let him be part of the football program because he had a hair trigger. All he did was fight and spend all his time in solitary. So Dwayne said, no, you're not gonna be any part of the team. So what this scene was, was the two of them coming together and this kid convincing Dwayne that he can be a part of the program and be a productive part of it. And I knew at that moment, you know, we've all seen people tough it out. But you want to talk about being able to completely block out what he was dealing with and rise to the occasion or accept the challenge, which was the saying on Gridiron Gang. Uh, he did it, and I knew at that moment, I said, God, this guy, you know, he, he wasn't created. We'll just say that. You know, there's enough created, fabricated, tough guys in Hollywood or greats in Hollywood. And, and I knew at that moment this guy was genuine. He was sincere. He was passionate and, you know, went all in. Take us back to the documentary that you did. How did that come about? Hmm. Funny story. Um, we, my father, my stepmother and I had done a host of reality shows before the term was a term. It, they were documentaries uh, on probated youth. It started with Desperate Passage back in 1986, then became Maiden Voyage. Uh, Desperate Passage was with Michael Landon, Maiden Voyage with Sharon Glass. Then it was A Step Apart with Marlo Thomas. And then... You know, Eddie James almost had done a few of them, and they were just, they had got, you know, these wonderful great actors to host or narrate these documentaries about probated youth that we did. And it was basically, they were done to show America the heart's cry of troubled youth, that they are still kids, um, that they weren't raised, they were basically put out and often were raised by street gangs or, you know, by pimps and drug dealers and that these these were still children they were still human beings that deserved a chance and um, you know, we learned over the years that a kid didn't care what you thought unless he unless he knew you cared and then once we broke through that some, some just remarkable things happened and we ended up doing things about eight or nine so we had done a slew of these and had a lot of success and a couple of studios had optioned a few of them to be turned into scripted films and my stepmom, Linda, who I, I call mom, but um, my, my mom was reading the LA Times and there was a story in the Metro section about one of the jails that we had done a lot of filming at was starting a 
football team within the confines of the jail. And the hope was that these kids would be allowed to go out and play against the straight schools. And they started with an eight-man football team or a seven-man team the first year. And then the second year when we heard about it and it finally made press was they were, they were going to fill a full team. So mom came into the office and was all excited, threw the thing down on my dad's desk and said, oh my God, this is, this is a movie. My dad was like, yeah, I, we, we've done these. And Linda, God bless her, mom, she was like, no, 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 no. This is the one. This is the one. So she pushed him pretty hard. So after a few days, he called probation and said, hey, it's Lee, how you doing? We wanna come up, we'd love to do a documentary. We saw the article in the LA Times. And we've been doing this with probation at this point for seven years. We've had all the success and done well. And they kind of laughed us off and said, yeah, get in line. I'm like, what are you talking about? I said, well, ever since that article came out, every studio in Hollywood wants to do it. We're engaging, you name the actor, you name the producer, they're trying to negotiate the rights. This is, this is, out of your wheelhouse, guys, you know. So we kind of, we're like, well, that's too bad. that we, we got excited about it, assuming it was going to be ours, and we lost it. So about three weeks went by, and the head of probation called my father and said, are you still interested in doing the, uh, the, the story on the prison football team? And my father said, well, why? I thought you had Hollywood's elite. Yeah, we, we do, and we have, and we got a quick, quick crash course on how Hollywood does things. And we all decided we kind of like the way you guys do things. So if you'd like to do it, the rights are yours. We'll see you here. They start practice in three days. And we didn't have any money. And uh, we uh, we ended up just beg borrowing and stealing some cameras and got the funding after the fact. We'd like raced up to get it because I mean, how do you call up somebody and say, we need funding in three days. We just, we kind of knew that we could go to some of our trusted investors from the past shows but we just rolled the dice and grabbed a couple cameras and sound and a small crew of four of us is what it usually was and went up and shot. And um, we made the documentary, we, we got the funding. And when I say the funding, I think it was probably $200,000 to, to make this documentary. And what was really funny is in making it, um, you know, we covered the first game. And what you saw in the, the film with The Rock was a direct lift. I mean. Basically, Jeff McGuire, our writer, watched the documentary and just wrote what was there. It was all there. And it was interesting because the kids had lost their first game, cried like babies. We all went our separate ways. That was a movie. It was over. As far as we were concerned, it was over. And my father was speaking uh, for Janet Reno, who was the attorney general at the time in Atlanta, for a big FBI conference. They wanted my dad there because he understood so much about the youth of today and incarcerated youth, and they just kind of wanted to understand from somebody who had worked 20 years with these kids, kind of to hear his take on it, not being a clinical psych or a cop, you know, let's, let's hear somebody who's worked with these kids, different point of view. So my dad goes to Atlanta with my mom and they're gone. And it was like, they made a week out of it because my uncle lived in Florida and they were gonna spend time with them. I get this phone call from my father. He said, hey, uh, what are you doing this weekend? And I was like, well, I'm just hanging out, what's up? He said, you know, the documentary we did on the film, uh, with the football team. I said, of course. He said, well, those little brats are playing for the state championship. I need you to get a couple cameras. I need you to go handle it. And then there's an awards banquet after that. I need you to go deal with it. I'm stuck in Atlanta. So I had to scramble and get a couple of great cameramen. I think it was Philip Hearn and Steve Elkins and uh, Chip Brooks did sound and me directing. And we went out and shot uh, their championship game against Montclair Prep where they lost 13 to seven. And, uh, and then the awards banquet at the old Sportsman's Lodge right after that. And then uh, that was it. And um, that's how it came about. And uh, nobody wanted it. It was interesting with all the success we had, nobody wanted it. It sat, um, was, it was Steve Bell who had basically given us anything we wanted at KTLA and Tribune to launch our shows was no longer there. He had gone to start, I think, Stars or Encore. So we were dealing with a new regime at KTLA and, and uh, Tribune, and they didn't really capture the vision. And our agents at CAA at the time watched it and said, that's a, that's a cute little documentary. And, um, you know, my dad went back to get the VHS from the projectionist at CAA, and he was wiping his eyes. He said, I heard what he said. Don't listen to a word. This is one of the most powerful things I've ever seen. You're gonna do great with this. And we finally got it on TV. It won an Emmy for, uh, I don't know what the heck it won for, but it was it was a big national Emmy. It won my dad. 
And uh, the day after it aired on TV, every studio but Paramount called to make a bid. Every A-list actor you can imagine was calling. I mean, we went into the office the next day, there was, you know, the thing ran out of tape. And the next week, the phone just rang off the hook. You know, it was everybody trying to get the rights. So it was an incredible experience. It was a, a whirlwind. And then it took another 14 years to get made. <laughs> so can we can we have a condensed version of those 14 years and why? Sure. Why do you think? I can condense it real easy. Nothing took... happened. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm why sorry. do you think that is? Well, it was easy. I mean, you know, Mark Canton ran the studio. Uh, it, they had to have it because everybody else wanted it. They paid the most and gave us the prettiest pitch. So uh, Jeff McGuire had just written the uh, In the Line of Fire with Clint Eastwood and Wolfgang uh, Peterson and got the Academy Award nomination. So he was our writer. So the film acquired two million and a half, I think two and a half million dollars of, of studio costs against it. And then Canton was out, he was fired. And the new regime came in and usually what happens is, is all those films that have been sitting around go in a turnaround. So they, they put Gridiron in a turnaround. They're like, yeah, you know, whatever. This is the old. So after uh, 18 months of development, another reason I don't like it, the film sat with a two and a half million dollar lien against it. And I don't think a month went by in 12 years where somebody didn't call and say, what's going on with Gridiron? We'd love to make it. And we said, hey, there's a two and a half million dollar fee against it. If you wanna pay off Sony, we can start from scratch and make the movie. And most people would hang up before we were done with the sentence. It was like, yeah, not gonna happen. And uh, um, yeah, so 14 years went by. It was from 1993 till 2005. So what is that, 12 years? went by and then uh, Neil Moritz, who we had known years ago when he first started his career with Juice and um, Stone Age. Uh, we always had a respect for each other and Neil had become obviously quite the producer with things like Fast and the Furious and a whole list of other films. And just called up Neil one day when I heard Friday Night Lights was getting done and they were gonna make Invincible, they were gonna make um, We Are Marshall, they were making Facing the Giants. We talked earlier about how Hollywood likes to keep doing the same thing. Called Neil and said, do you want to make Red Iron Gang? He said, yes, let's do it. And we had a meeting. My father and I went and saw Neil. And he said, do me a favor. Before you come to my office, Shane, give me a list of cast. He said, this thing has fallen on its face time and time again. It's about the cast. we got to make this thing cast right. So I spent the night putting together a cast that I thought was going to change the world and put the world on, on its ear. And... Uh, while doing that, my wife, girlfriend at the time, Val, said, come in here, I want you to see what I'm watching on TV. And I ignored her, I said, I'm busy, I'm playing Hollywood producer. She came into my office and she had tears pouring down her face and said, you need to, you need to come in here. She said, I got your guy. And I said, come on, man, really? She said, come in. Well, she was watching the A&E biography on The Rock. And you know, he had been arrested, I think a dozen times before his 18th birthday, football saved him and how he thought he was going to be an NFL player coming off a championship college team and ended up breaking his neck or rupturing all his discs, started over from nothing. And I watched and was just fascinated. And I literally hit the delete button on the document on my, on my computer, went in to see Neil the next day. We caught up, hadn't seen each other in person in a while, congratulated him on all of his success. And uh, he said, great, all right, where's your list? And I said, I didn't make a list. And you can see he deflated. And I said, I got the, I got the guy. He said, kind of needed a list. What do you got? And I said, The Rock. And he thought for a minute and he yelled to his assistant and said, when's my meeting with The Rock? And she said, you're having dinner with him tomorrow. He looked at me and he said, I am having dinner with him tomorrow. We're trying to figure out something to do. This could be the one. He said, get me a copy of the, the, the documentary you guys did on DVD. And let's find that original script that McGuire wrote. 15 years ago. He was probably gonna to need to be dusted off and modernized, but I wanna go with that script. Just give me the DVD and have it back here by tomorrow. I'm having dinner with him tomorrow night. So I didn't have a DVD of Gridiron Gang. It was on VHS. So I found a place that, that converted it for me in literally a half a day. Sunset Video, ran it down to Neil's office just in time. And two days later, Neil called and said, Dwayne wants to meet you guys. And we hung out at the jail and it was a great experience. And he, he encountered the kids and saw what we were doing and said, I commit, let's make the movie. And, 14 years later, we were rolling camera. <laughs> and that was it. So that that meeting took place and then he, he committed to it. So take me on why people were passing on it. I'm, I'm confused, sorry. What, why were people passing on it within that time? Would, he hadn't reached the level that he is now at? 
Uh, I'm confused. Nobody passed audit once once he signed on and mm -hmm. went right to Sony. We had a greenlit picture. He was very much in demand. It was the documentary that we struggled to get seen. Uh, I see. From, okay. Like doing the documentary and having tremendous success. I mean, we had already won 12 Emmys and had 32 nominations and nobody wanted to watch this one, which was kind of part of the same genre. Sure. Mm -hmm. As, eh. And then finally we kind of bartered a deal at KTLA to get them to put it on. And once it got on, every studio wanted it. So we spent eight months getting courted by everybody from Disney to Sony to Warner to Universal and then went with Sony, and then Canton developed it, and then he got fired. So then everything just went in a turnaround. So it's that. We, just, we couldn't do anything with it because there was a $2 million lien against it from Sony. And what was really cool, maybe this will help clarify, Neil, because of his reputation and his deals that he had at Sony, he was like, look, the $2.5 million they're claiming needs to be paid back. He goes, that was 14 years ago. That money's been written off. It's done. It's gone. It's a new regime. I will deal with that. And Neil went in and talked to Amy Pascal, who, who captured the vision of the project and was very excited about it and said, all right, let's waive the two and a half. Let's, let's put a new, let's put this back on a fast track and, you know, we'll get a start we want and we're excited about, let's do it. Fortunately, they were excited about Dwayne and we were rolling. He had to go shoot a film. I think it was Doom or the game plan. And then I think it was Doom. And then as soon as he got back, we started ours immediately. And then and off we went. And then what was the reception once the, the narrative version was finished? Once the film came out, it did very well. It was frustrating because we finished it in, uh, I think it was, oh, I want to say 05 or 06 in, in September. And we were supposed to come out during the Super Bowl, like build up to the Super Bowl. We wanted to give them that football movie. And at the last minute, Sony decided, yeah, we're going to push it another nine months. We'll come out in September. So it was like, ah, well, it's only been 13 years. What's another nine months? Um, film came out, it went number one, did very well. It was number one for two weeks. Um, it did well. I think the fact that there were three other football movies out like Invincible and We Are Marshall and Facing the Giants didn't help us. But it still, I think it did 30 or 38 million domestic in the box office. One thing that you don't hear about was we were very fortunate with home video. Sony created Blu-ray, as we all know. And there was a race between two mediums. It was Blu-ray and another home high def system. I don't remember what it was. And Sony decided when they launched Blu-ray, they were going to do it on two films. They did Spider-Man 2 and they did Gridiron. So what happened is, is Gridiron came back and Dwayne had become such a big star during that time. The DVD and what little VHS sales were, were, were very, very strong. And then when they recycled it for Blu-ray, while it was still relevant, it, it more than doubled again. So it had this extra boost that nobody expected, which was really special. So yeah, that was that was gridiron. It did well. It was fun. And you know, it's nice to to have that uh that in my resume. And I don't mean that. It's it's you know a, a, a career that's now 48 years going. It's nice to have had the number one blockbuster. And it it gives me, we talked about chasing that success I had as a 16 year old. It gave me that validation. It, at 30, 37, 36. And it, 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 it really reminds me that everything's okay. You know, maybe every 10, 15 years I'll have one, but maybe I won't again, but it's okay. I, I slayed the dragon and I can just move forward and be comfortable with what I do. And you had some people give you advice as well that had also had success early in life who, who kind of like put things in perspective. I know it was very, very fortunate, you know, with some of the, the people that I, I run with or worked with or befriended over the years, you know, people that come to mind are people like Charlie Sheen or Brett Michaels, uh, you know, there's the singer from Poison, obviously, Rock of Love, Celebrity Apprentice, everybody knows Brett now uh, from all different different places. And Brett and I have been best friends since no, probably 93 or 94. And here's a guy who had tremendous success, came from very humble beginnings. You know, him and his, him and the guys from Poison jumped in a van, drove from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to LA, lived in an abandoned warehouse or a, an abandoned laundromat uh, for three years trying to make it. And they had, in the 80s and 90s, had so much success. And then the music styles changed and talk about a guy who was able to reinvent himself. You know, Brett's had to reinvent himself three times and he's done well every time. And the one thing he taught me 
was the cool thing is, you know, and he had every rose has its thorn was his number one hit. So we, we kind of joked about, I had my gridiron, he had his every rose. It was kind of funny when that finally happened. And he said, here's the cool thing about that. Nobody can ever take it away from you. He goes, there will be another 52 movies this year that'll go number one. He goes, that's fine, but you still went number one. And I never forgot that. I never wore that conceitedly or with arrogance, but it was, it gave me the affirmation that I think so many artists, you know, you want that and that, that helped. Um, but he always gave me the greatest advice. He always said, um, no one to get off the merry-go-round. You know, we talked about that, you know, getting off the merry-go-round at the right time. There's people that jump off it too soon and it's still moving too fast and that's not good. You know, you think about getting off the merry-go-round too fast, it'll kill you. And then there's the people that hang on it too long and it comes to a stop and people are waiting for you to get off. He said, what you have to do is figure out how to ride certain moments of your career and know when to step away. And um, it's never easy, you know, and I say that, I talk about a film that, you know, you have a film that does well, you can, you can, I'll use a very generic term, you can milk that as long as you think you can, but you try not to over milk it, you, you try not to hinge your, your future on it. You realize, hey, we, we were fortunate, we were blessed, we had a moment in time that nobody can take from us, and there are going to be 51 other number one movies this year, so we need to get moving and let the next people come in and do what they need to do and enjoy the moment and let's go on and go back to work. So uh, I've, I've had some good advice with some people in my life that have kind of been that done there. I think that, you know, been very helpful to me. Why not give up on the project earlier, 10 years in? You're talking about giving it up while it was sitting at Sony. Well, it, it, we did because it was in turnaround and I didn't have two and a half million dollars laying around with accruing interest to pay them off to get it back. The one thing that always gave us hope was, as I said, I don't think a month went by in 12 years where somebody called and said, hey, what's going on? There was actually a time where Peter Gruber called and said, um, I know you've got your, your deal with Sony, that's gotta be paid off. I used to be head of Sony. I may be able to make that work. I really would like to try to make this into something. So we, we did a deal with, De, uh, with Mandalay, Peter Goober, uh, before we ended up making it with Neil. Um, there were a few people that, that would try to do some creative. So when you have a project and it's, it's generating that interest for so long with people with that kind of juice, you never wanna throw that away. You know, we talked earlier about what's a good script, what's a good story, what can you use to get a foothold in this industry? Well, when you have a product and you've got the Peter Goobers or the Neil Moritzes or the Joe Roths or the Bobby Newmeyers calling you on a regular basis saying, what's going on, man, let's, you know? Well, okay, there's something there. You don't just bury it. You can't, you can't. So I think there was always the hope that it would get done one day. I think my dad and I had always kind of said, you know, one day maybe something will come along. Maybe we'll have success somewhere else enough where we can buy out that two million and get it done. You know, um, but it, it all worked out. And so when you filmed at the Sportsman's Lodge, both schools were there, right, for this dinner? No. This was all for the kids. Oh, okay. It was all for the Mustangs. Interesting. Yeah, and I don't think it was the Sportsman's Lodge. It was... It was a, sh it was, it's where, it's where um, there's a sushi spot there. Right now it's an all you can eat sushi place off Winneka in Tampa, across from the Osh. It used to be called the Smorgasbord Inn. It was a sports banquet lodge, similar to Sportsman's Lodge, but it wasn't. So I, you don't have to put that in, but it's so funny. I just say Sportsman's Lodge because everybody knows it, but it was like the Swedish Inn or something like that. Okay. Yeah, and it was the it was the parents and the kids, and sadly there was only a few parents. You know, we had forty eight kids on the team, and I think eight parents showed up. And it was tragic. It was sad. That's just that's the way it is. How much should a filmmaker pay themselves? Whatever they can. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it depends. You know, when I say filmmaker, I think about me, I'm involved concept to delivery. You know, I just got into it with somebody the other day who worked on our last film and they worked, I think, four to six weeks on break even. I just celebrated my 27th month on the film last week. Now, we lost five months of COVID, but during the COVID time, we had to repurpose our distribution outlets what we were gonna do. So I ended up dealing with a whole new list of deliverables, whole new group of people with different QC demands, you know, for quality control, for release. So, you know, there are people on that film that worked three or four weeks, they got paid a hell of a lot more than I did. 
And, you know, here I am, I'm literally like almost two and a half years in and I wouldn't change a thing about it. I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love to do it. I, I just, I enjoy the process. But, you know, uh, I always say, be fair. You're gonna have an investor that you wanna be able to have an open books relationship with. If you have an investor that says, I'd like to see the books, you don't wanna, you know, that's not a good position to be in. There are plenty of people you can Google in Hollywood who have gone to prison. Um, I always say just when you hand an investor a budget, you live by it. And you can put clauses in your financing agreement that say, hey, if we come in under budget, I get to keep it. Or if I come in under budget, let's split what's left. Or, you know, but I, I think whatever you can pay yourself, if you're raising the money, you're creating the content, you're creating jobs for, you know, and break even 125 people, you know, get what you can. You know, because you're gonna give the money back to your investors, I trust. So you may never see another dime, you know? Uh, so I, I never try to tell people what they should or shouldn't pay themselves. I just say, if you were the investor of the film and you, your filmmaker was being paid what you're paying yourself, would you feel comfortable looking? Would you, would, you, would you be okay looking at those books? And I think if you can answer yes, that's fine. I've never had an, an investor I've never had an investor ask me in 30 years of raising independent money how much I'm paying myself. I've had their lawyer ask me once. One time I had a lawyer ask me and I've never been asked since. And I was very direct with the lawyer. At the time I belonged to four unions and I said, well, I'm a union member for the following guilds. I will be doing all four of these jobs on the film. I am not gonna be taking my union rates. I have parked my union membership so I could do this project this is what I normally get paid. Here's what I'm doing it for. And he was like, wow, okay. I just, he, and he was like, I just didn't know. <laughs> I thought he was questioning my value. He just was curious. But um, I, I say, you know, you're gonna be, you know, every film is a love affair. You're gonna walk away from it scarred, heartbroken, chipped teeth, black eyes, gray, bald, fat, thin. It's, it's, gonna, it's gonna do this to you. you know, you're gonna lose 20 pounds in pre-production, you're gonna put on a few pounds during production and you're gonna put on 25 pounds in post. You know? So I, I just say, you know, be fair to yourself. Um, realize that this is gonna be probably a, a year to an 18 month process. And what is your time worth? And uh, don't bankrupt the project because you have to be greedy or get paid. You know, budget yourself accordingly. You're a line item. You know, every job you do is a line item. If you if you're writing the script, you're, you should be paid as a writer. If you're producing, you should be paid as a producer. If you're directing it the same and editing it the same. If you're supervising music and doing post-production and deliverables, that costs money. Somebody's gotta get paid to do it, right? So. Which production taught you the most? You don't have to name names or the name of the movie or who you work with, but it just taught you the most, whether it was something about yourself, whether it was something about how you were working with people, Something where it, it changed you in a lot of question. ways. Could be for better or worse. I, you know, I grew up, as you know, doing independent shoestring thread budgets with my dad. I mean, we were doing, we were doing films that had million dollar budgets for 20 grand back in the day when we were shooting in film. And I learned so you have to learn so much if you're gonna make it work. I mean, we literally did these films on crews of three to five. So you could be shooting a camera and you could be also holding a boom pole and mixing an, you know, an FP32 mixer on your hip as you're trying to pull focus and shoot. And you kind of become those, you know, those musicians that wear the, the cymbals on their knees and the bass drum and the tambourine on their head. And you kind of do a lot of that. I think I got shaped doing those. The first major film I produced was a $12 million film for Miramax back in the day. And it was frustrating because I knew how to do so much and wasn't allowed. But what was really cool when we got there, I still got to do so much. I had I'd co-written the script and I'd produced the film. I was one of the producers of the film. And before we were done, I ended up doubling for one of the big stars. I ended up cutting the film and ended up being, you know, working with the post supervisors and the music supervisors. And I got to do a lot of things again. And that was really fun. And I, it reminded me that, you know, when you work in big budget, Phil, it's funny, there's people to do everything, you know, it's spread out so much, but I come from, 
a, a place where everybody did it so much. And I, I like when everybody does so much. And what's funny is after living in COVID, going back to work where the demands or the crews are smaller, the people who know how to do much are the ones who are gonna be called. Because I know when we're crewing up for this new film that we're gearing up to do, everybody's gotta be able to do a lot of things. I mean, even my camera operators, they gotta be able to do a lot of things. You know, my my it's no longer hair, makeup, and wardrobe and props. It's one person who's gonna handle all four of those. It's the only way it's gonna work, you know? And uh, so I learned from everything. Every production I've ever done, Karen, I learned from, and I, I appreciate each experience. I learn something new on every show. What's the worst piece of advice you've received? And it actually turned out to be true. But at the time when you heard it, you thought, I'm not listening to this person. Worst piece of advice I ever got that turned out to be true. Who? I think the worst advice I ever got that turned out to be true was um, was something that my photo teacher taught me in my senior year in high school, Mr. Ken Neely. He, uh, he called me in after class one day and he said, I'm worried about your future. He said, you're a jack of all trade, master of none. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you're here in photo class, you're doing okay, you take a decent picture. He goes, you race dirt bikes, you play drums in a band and you've won an Emmy already. He's like, what's your plan, dude? Like, you gotta like, and I got really concerned about that and I gave up a lot of things in my life because of that. And what's weird is, I don't know if that was bad advice, but it was true. And I didn't listen to the advice and I just became this guy that did a lot of things that I, I do well enough to, to work and to stay relevant. Am I a great storyteller? No. Am I a great director that's putting the world on their, on their ear? No, not reinventing the wheel. Uh, am I a great editor that's gonna, you know, come up with a way to cut a film differently than anybody else has? No. So I'm not able to put all of my energy into one thing. I am really glad now that I'm almost 50, I've been able to stay working for as long as I have because I did become a jack of all trade. I don't think if I, if, if I had listened to his advice and not pumped the brakes after a year and a half of getting rid of everything in my life that was important to me, I would have truly learned the craft of everything I could. So I know that's not the answer to the question you asked, but that is the one thing that has constantly haunted me over the years, was the advice, did I do it right? What did I give up? And then how did I reboot myself? And then I look later and I go, well, I've, I've, I've actually been, I'm, I'm okay. So, you know. Did you tell other people about that conversation and, and did they steer you away from doing too much? It's funny, every time I start a film, everybody tells me, you do too much, we're gonna be here to support you. You do too much, we're gonna take a lot of it off you. And I don't know if it's me not truly embracing and trusting the people I work with enough to, tr to trust that that's going to happen or it's going to be okay. Um, I'm not a control freak. Um, I'm very hands-on, but I've also been around too many productions when people assume somebody's going to take care of something and it I just, it's unacceptable when they fall through the cracks and I'm just somebody that knows if I handle it, it won't. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. It doesn't mean I'm great. It just means that I know if it's on my list of do's, it's uh, if I know if it's on my list of to do's, it's going to get done. And I'm very hard to trust people with doing those things. So, um, again, I don't know if I'm answering your question properly, but you know, I I have spent my entire career being told by people, well, we just want you to direct, and we just want you to deal with this, and I haven't been able to do that because. You know, I haven't felt that, I haven't had the peace in my heart to do that, and I wish I had. And it's nothing anybody has done. It's, it's my own problem. It's not somebody has dropped the ball or let me down. It's that fear. It's waking up at two in the morning, as I talk about in the book, when the, in a sweat. Scared to death the wrong actor's gonna show up tomorrow. Scared to death that we didn't get a permit. Scared to death that we didn't order the drone or whatever. And I know if I'm handling it, it's not gonna fall through the cracks. So. 
But it sounds like, too, you love to be busy. I do. You're like I do. ambidextrous. You're always doing things. ADHD, but same difference, right? Or Gemini. You have oh, yeah, Gemini. Oh, yeah, so, so you yeah. just certain people just love to be... They, they just have certain ways about them. They love to be busy. And I love to be busy. I'd love not to be as busy as I am, but I always find that I'm never not. I'm never still. I'm never still. And I always say I'm going to stop taking things on, and then three days go by, and I'm sitting here looking at four other projects that I just committed to get involved with. What was I thinking? But somehow, some way, they get done. Yeah. You know. I mean, I think just certain people are hardwired differently. I am. Definitely no, hardwired and, differently. And, <laughs> but no, I mean, not in a bad way. Kidding, but it, Yeah, but just wanting to, to say, or they, they like, they have a TV show on, they're cleaning something over here, so they're looking at Twitter, there's just, yeah, just some people I don't vacation that. well, I don't, I don't take days off, I don't vacation. Luckily, my wife is kind of, we love our little world and what we do, and there's not, we're not people that take two weeks every year to go do anything. You know, we take day trips once every week or every other week go do fun things. We, we're always together. I mean, we both work from home, so we're, we're together all the time. So we have our time together, but I never, oh my God, I gotta get away and go to Hawaii, or I need to jump on a plane and go somewhere. You know, I, it's never been in my DNA. No cruises? No, God, no. What are the top five reasons an investor will invest in your project? Top five reasons an investor will invest in somebody uh, or their project, I think number one is because they want to help you. I think anytime you go to an investor, it's somebody who's probably in better circumstance than you are, or at least has the ability to help get you to the next level, make your dreams come true. I have had investors that get behind me simply because there's a trust level. There's a feeling of wanting to help me get to another level of my career. Um, sometimes it's because they feel a project's important. Often it's because they want to get a tax write-off. I mean, there's the business side of the business too. You know, I, I believe that, you know, astute investors are taught by business managers to avoid three or four different investments. One, one is nightclubs and restaurants, one is recording studios, and the other is movies. I mean, that's just like, those are the three you don't do. So getting private equity together for making motion pictures is, is difficult. We have kind of a stigma going in. There's already a, you know, a couple of strikes against us. So what's important is that we're able to appeal to an independent, an ind I'm sorry, what's important is that we're able to appeal to individual financiers or investors with what it is that we're trying to achieve with our work. I think that's really important. And I, as I talk about a lot in my book, I think it's really important for, for filmmakers to really do their research on people. Don't just go meet rich people, meet people who can identify with what it is you're trying to do. You may have a passion project that you wanna do, but you can do your research on a specific investor and learn that they may have a passion or an interest. Think about doing something that is something that they will be more open or interested in doing and go down that road so when you meet with them, they're excited and thrilled about what it is you're trying to pitch. Take care of business, do that. And then they're gonna come usually if it's successful and a good, a good journey and say, what is it you wanna do? And that's often been the hardest thing because, you know, again, as filmmakers, we're myopic. We think about what we want to do. And often you have to think about what other people want to do that are in a position of helping us. So I always say go in with an open heart, go in with an open mind, be willing to bob and weave a little bit off of your plan. At the end of the day, the goal is to work. The goal is to make new relationships. I mean, I have investors that we've known for 35 years that have faithfully gotten involved. I have investors that have invested one time that I've known 25 years and we're still best of friends and they did it one time and didn't ruin the friendship, it's just they wanted to try. And I have, I have uh, you know, friends that I've, I've known for 25 and 30 years who would never invest in this business and they are more than capable. It's just to each his own. But I think um, people will want to, I, I say, you know, you always have to remember you're under the watchful eye. If you are going to approach people to invest in you realize you're gonna become an open book. They're gonna look at your social media. They're gonna look at how you conduct yourself. They're gonna invite you to parties where there's gonna be alcohol because they want you to drink and they wanna see how you're gonna behave. People don't realize that. I mean, I know a lot of real close calls friends of mine have had over the years where like, God, you know, I had an investor on the hook, had this party, I drank too much, passed out at the guy's place. Well, 
duh. You know, they're, they're almost saying, here, let me see how you do. What can I trust you with? And just remember, you have to treat their money like it's your money. And I think, you know, some of the success that we've had with our investors, it's not always about how much the return on investment was. It's about a trust level. It's about the experience. Let them feel involved. You know, I send my investors emails at the end of every night telling them good, bad, or indifferent how the day went. And then once we're in post-production, I, I fill them in once a week. And it's that way in pre-production too. I just feel that they, we're doing what we do because they trust in us and they gave us the means to do it. You have to let them feel involved. And a lot of times these investors, believe it or not, are a little bored doing what they do and they see this as kind of a neat little fun outlet. So involve them. You know, let them feel a part of what you're doing. That being said, have you ever put money from a credit card into any of your projects? Have I ever put money from a credit card into one of my projects? Um, oh, yeah. Um, there's been times where I've done uh, self-funded projects. You know, I talk about the $500 pilot. I talk about the $10,000 movie. I mean, I had an investor that came to me with $20,000 and said, I want to make a movie with you and um, didn't account for SAG bonds and the fact that it was kind of a sequel remake to something we did that was on SAG Experimental and had to repay all the actors for the work they did the year before. So that 20,000 turned into 12,000 really quick. And the investor was cool enough to say, I'll throw an additional amount in for the bond, but that's it because he would get his bond back. So we really had about 12 grand to work with. And there was a couple of days that it was kind of like, all right, you know, let's feed the crew well tonight and just, you know, it's part of it. Um, but I've never had to like max out a credit card to make a movie or anything. I, I, I haven't had to do that. I max out credit cards doing other stupid shit. <laughs> I know, no swearing. I had to throw that. No more jet skis though. So we're no good. more jet skis. Yeah, no, so that, we're good. that's over. That's over. It's <laughs> a good question. Though. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's a valid yeah, question. We did Dark Side. I, I put about $3,500 on credit cards to feed. I just, the people weren't eating well enough and the, the budget was so cheap and they were all working for nothing. And it was like, God damn, I gotta, I gotta feed these guys. So I just, I told my wife, I'm like, I, I can't do the Subway and pizza thing for 15 days. We're, we're going to feed them every three days really well. But we did. We did. And I think we got, I think we got a good result from that. You know, and you feed them well. Happy crew. Happy movie, right? Just want to be fed and respected. You know. If you invest 250000 in a movie, does that mean it's going to sell for at least 250000 Oh, hell no. It's like putting $75 million into a movie and sometimes it makes back $10 million. I mean, there's no guarantees. Um, obviously, the more money you have to play with, um, hopefully the better the cast, the more bankable the cast, the more well-known the cast. But you don't always have that. I mean, we've done a lot of $250,000 movies. And I think, again, it comes down to telling a good story. It comes down to getting a good cast. It's recognizable and marketable. Um, and it's also about those locations you know, take people places they want to go, make them never feel like they're watching a $250,000 movie. You know, I take a lot of pride in, in my $20,000 movie we really did for 12 grand. A lot of people don't know the story of that and what it did for my career. I actually got more out of my career because of that than I did from Gridiron Gang. Um, and I did it after Gridiron Gang. What's interesting is, is I had done a film, I wanted to tell a story, and I, um, for me, it was about showing people what I could do on a dime. That's, as you know, if you've read my book, it's about making films for a dime that turn and make a dollar. That's what it's about. So for me, I went out and we made this, let's just say $12,000 movie after I put in a few grand on my credit card to feed. Um, I had a friend who was very tight with Sumner Redstone, who at the time, who you know, he just passed, but Sumner was the head of Viacom. And a friend of mine got it to Sumner and said, a friend of mine made this. I don't know if you want to watch it or not. I want you to watch it and check it out. He's like, well, why am I watching it? Well, there's pretty girls in it. You'll like it. But I want you to watch it for the production value. And when you're done watching, I want you to guess what he made it for. So Sumner sat through this 90-minute debauchery of mine. It wasn't a great story. It just was a pretty movie. And he was pleased and impressed with it and glad he watched it. And he said, oh, I guess he probably put a couple million into it. And my friend said, well, he actually put about 12 grand into it. Sumner picked up the phone, called Brad Gray. God rest him, he's dead too. Picked up the phone and called Brad Gray and said, I just saw a movie that apparently was made for $12,500. I could have sworn it was made for a couple million. I need to get it to you. Film got sent to Brad. I got a call from Brad Gray the next day. 
He said, yeah, I need you to start meeting with our people. We want to get you in here. I met with Les Moonves. I met with Michael de, uh, de Bulbray, who was running Paramount at the time. And it opened up Amy Powell, who was running Insurge, which is, you know, did Paranormal Activity and a lot of other great films. And that film opened up a lot of doors for me because it showed people what I could do for a dime. And it, and it allowed my investors to come back out of the woodwork who I hadn't worked with in many years. Because, you know, you go make a film with Sony, you're not hitting people up for a quarter million dollars to make movies. You're making a, you know, you're making a studio movie. So it reopened those great opportunities and kind of just reminded me, okay, you don't need big budgets to make something look nice. Now we just got to focus on making better movies. Mm -hmm. And it's been a fun journey. But yeah, we, um, or David Bulbery was the guy at Paramount. But um, it, it, it opened those doors for me that, you know, having a number one blockbuster never got me. So I really encourage people to make those low budget, glossy, good looking films. If your story sucks, they better look good. And I went in on the merit of guess what I did it for. And um, people had thought, you know, 600,000, most people who were in the know figured 600 to a million. It was a $20,000, $15,000 movie. Yeah. That actually ended up being 12 because 12. didn't you, you lost some of the money. Well, it was a 20, credits. 20 or $25,000 was the original agreement, but because of our previous jot with SAG and those actors, we had to repay them for their first. So we lost about eight grand to SAG. So that came down to about 12. And then, you know, we ended up, you know, probably putting in about 2,800 of my own for food and stuff. So yeah, you know, about 15,000. Wow. How long was the shoot? How many days? 12 days. 12 days shoot. Pick, did a, I did a day of, uh, I did a day of second unit with two of the actors because they were friends of mine. They did it off the grid. You know, I wanted them in the car driving, you know, drive-bys and stuff. And then I went out and just grabbed a camera and just second unit did the hell out of it. You know, got those great magic hour shots and just filled up the, just filled it up with some pretty, you know, but it was well shot. It was well acted. Um, you know, we had Sean Young, Betsy Russell from Saw, Ron Masak, who's been in everything, um, Courtney Gaines from Children of the Corn. I mean, every face in it was recognizable. Jason Pace, Ryan. Um, oh, I'm blanking on Ryan's name. It's my fault. There was just some really good talent in that film. And uh, I was proud of it because it looked pretty. It was a beautiful movie. It was a horrible movie, but it was a beautiful movie. Why was it horrible? It was just stupid. It was, you know, I did, I... I did the first one, which was a pure story about a story I wanted to tell. And that was the pilot that I did for 500 bucks. And somebody saw it and said, oh my God, you gotta make a sequel to this. And that was that was the mistake, story-wise. There was no sequel. But somebody was throwing 20 bucks, you know, 20 grand down to make a movie. Yeah. I'm not doing anything this week, let's do it, you know? And so we did it. Do you think that if you'd had more time, you had said it was a 12 day shoot, if you'd had more time, would it have been better or no, the story was, was fundamentally? Script. It was a horrible script. No, it looked good. I mean, you know, again, it's a 15, 12 to $15,000 movie that some people thought we spent 600,000 to 2 million to make. So it visually was fine. It was, it was just, the script was written in like a week. I mean, it was just in no development notes. It was like, oh, here was the prequel. Just, just let's just carry on and write and tell a story. And it was, it was just, you know. It's more of an experiment. I see. Yeah, it was fun. What's the shortest amount of time you've written a script? I did a 36 hour fade in to the end for Emmett and Furla Films um, project called Bad News that I wrote for them. And I did it in, I did it on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday without sleep. No drugs, hmm. without sleep. And I crashed Thursday. At some point, I physically collapsed in my condo. And I woke up at some point Friday, printed it out, called Emmett and Furla, drove it to them at the Warner lot, and they optioned it. They called me Monday, said, we love it. It's exactly what we need. We want it. That was, that was three days, nonstop. Did the, the, the lack of sleep help you get into a mindset? Was it some type of a sci-fi fantasy? No, 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 it was an action film. It was, I knew the story I wanted to tell and Emmett and Furla were friends. We had done a film or two with them and they were buying. They were working with people at the time that I worked with in the past. They were working with Avi Lerner and uh, Cassian Elways and Mark Rifkin and some of those guys from the late 90s that I had worked with that were just cranking out these 10 to $20 million action movies. So I knew what they wanted. And 
they were they were optioning scripts and they were paying to do it. And these guys, I pitched George on it over the phone and he said, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Give me a script. And this was like on Tuesday. I hung up the phone. It was like three o'clock in the afternoon. I just started writing. I started writing and I, I collapsed at some point Thursday and realized that I wrote the end. And uh, Did you wake up and like the room was spinning or what happened? Did someone find you? <laughs> <laughs> I was living alone at the time. It was after my first... Uh, my first divorce, so I was back living alone. Uh, you know how us bachelors, when we find our way back to bachelorhood, usually live. I, I, you know, I, it was crazy. It was just, I remember that time very vividly. And I remember writing it Tuesday afternoon, collapsing at some point Thursday. And you know, every when you wake up Friday, everything's still a blur. And I just remember hitting print. There was 96 pages, and I just hit print. I punched hold them put a Brad in him, called their office to make sure Dal was their guy at the time who was head of, of development. And I said, Dal, it's Shane, I'm coming. Will you give me a pass? He goes, yeah, 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 we're waiting for you, dude. Drove onto the Warner lot, gave it to Dal and said, enjoy. And George called me, I think Monday or Tuesday and said, yeah, dude, you got a deal. This is great. <laughs> I, I will say George has better taste than that. This was 25 years ago. But yeah, that was the fastest script I ever wrote. Wow. Yeah. A lot of coffee? Oh yeah, crowning coffee. Okay. I don't know why. Crown Royal and coffee. Oh, wow. I don't know how. An empty stomach. Oh, wow. Yeah. You got to stay awake. Wow. And the little purple bag. Yeah. Crown probably Royal, smoked yeah. a lot, too. Smoke, oh, okay. I went through a phase where I was smoking a lot. I think oh, I wow. probably went through about 19 packs of cigarettes that week. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Thank God I'm vegan now. I'm making up, you know, <laughs> trying to take care of myself now that I'm old. <laughs> That's, that's just quite an image. I can I can almost see it. Yeah. I can tell you another story similar. Okay. Yeah. Please. I tell I tell you another funny story similar. We did no code of conduct uh, for for Dimension, which was Merrimax. Um, it was a twelve million dollar film we shot. We had a green light on a script. Charlie Sheen starred in it, and we had written it. They didn't want to tell that story, so they had brought two other writers on. A couple of great guys, Ed Masterson and Bill Gukwa. Um, really cool guys. We ended up becoming very good friends for a long time. Actually, one of them bought a car for me. And um, we got to Phoenix, and the director and Charlie read the script, and they go, what the, what the hell is this? And I said, I don't know, that's what they sent. They go, well, we start shooting in 48 hours. Get your laptop, fade in. So we rewrote the script in Arizona two days before we shot from page one and just about page one rewrite. That was another all, same time of my life it was within give or take a few years. So I was, I was still able to do that. And how does that work with the original credit? Who cares? We're just a bunch of dumb people making movies. You know, I mean, they paid, they paid us. We were producing the film. They paid the writers. It was like they had a deal with the writers anyway. So those, it was like, we wrote the film, Charlie, Brett Michaels and I wrote the script, and then they agreed to make the movie. We went to Phoenix to make the movie, and then somebody got in the mix and said, that's not the script we want to make, and hired two writers, didn't tell us anything about it, and just sent us a script. The guys never came out to Arizona. They were just two guys in LA that were told to rewrite a script that they weren't happy with because it was originally written for LA, and then they sent us to Phoenix for a 30% tax credit. So we get there and it's just the domino effect. You change the scripts, like what the hell is this? This isn't what we, you know, Charlie has not why I'm here. I didn't agree to do this. And it was our company. Charlie, Brett and I had a company. So it was like, yeah, and they just said, well, come on Dynamo, and get some Jolt Cola or, you know, get some coffee and fire it up, let's go. And we did a, we did a 48 hour, two days before we wrote, or rewrote the whole script and they, I don't think they ever knew it. So what was, what was our 47 like? Hour 47, I remember being in the Homestead Village. They hadn't set us up in our homes yet. They gave us homes. It was a you know, $12 million film in Phoenix in the 90s. That's a lot of money. They had us in a Homestead Village and we each had our own unit. And I remember being in Brett's at his cabinet. I probably, I probably smoked three packs of cigarettes a day and just drank coffee. It was nuts. And then there was a Kenny Rogers Roasters that, that would deliver right at the end. It was like that, that episode of Seinfeld. And I was like, just living on Kenny Rogers Roasters for like two weeks that we were there. And those last 48 hours, we went through like two buckets of chicken. It was brutal, it was brutal. It smelled in there. And then I had a day and a half. And I remember Joe Lando from Dr. Quinn was co-starring in it. He was our bad guy and he was a dear friend, he still is. And I remember going to my room 
and collapsing. And you know the sound of a hotel phone ringing, that loud chirp? It woke me up about 18 hours later. And have you ever woken up from a sleep so deep that you feel like you know you got punched by Mike Tyson and you just you're incoherent? I remember the phone ringing, waking up, and literally I couldn't see. My eyes were open, and I was I was like Mike Tyson on his hands and knees when he got knocked out and he was reaching. Remember when he was looking for his mouthpiece? That was me looking for the phone. I answered it. I had the upside down parts of my ear. I was like, ah, "Hello," and Joe's like, "Shane, it's Joe." I was like, "Yeah," and and he, to this day he still makes fun of me. Why I know the story, and he goes, "Dude, are you okay?" And I'm like, "Yes, you're back." And he goes, "I think I caught you sleeping or something. I'm gonna call you back." And I remember it woke me up and I remember I had to call him back and I couldn't find him and I was worried something was wrong. But yeah, that's that's what that was like. We started shooting, I think, the next morning at 5 a.m. With the script that the three of you had, had written. Yeah, and then the director decided at 5 a.m. he wanted to be in the movie and he wasn't written in the movie and turned to me and said, why don't you direct the opening scene? I'm gonna be in this. So that was my first directing job, really, without oh, getting wow. a job. So I, I shot the opening scene of No Code, yeah. The director decided to be in it. <laughs> <laughs> Has dealing with COVID been the most difficult stretch for you in your entire film career? Dealing with COVID has not been an issue other than things got shut down. I had a film that was uh, ready to go, that was greenlit, that we were going to be shooting the June after the March start of COVID. So that was disappointing. I've never had a green light on a film and watched it completely go away. That was kind of heartbreaking. I felt bad for the cast. I felt bad for the crew. Um, I am never bored. I always find something to do. And we've been very, very productive during COVID. I think between two writers and I, we've created over 30 projects, three writers and I, we've created over 30 projects, six screenplays. Uh, I got involved with a, a health and wellness documentary I've been helping kind of oversee for Pure Flix. That's been fun. Um, but I, as I told you earlier, I just got to the point where I said, it's time to go back to work and you know, people are working. There's a way to do this. And I have a lot of friends who have gotten back on set and they're working. I've got partners up in Canada right now shooting a film for Hallmark. Got other friends that are here in town shooting, you know, at Siren, they're doing the, the Will Ferrell and Julian Moore film and they're back to work. So we're chomping at the bit. So I'm, I'm just more restless now, ready to go. What do you see as the new normal post COVID? Whether, whether a vaccine is found, whether people want to take the vaccine, it's still around. People are still being cautious. God, if you're going to go two years on this interview, Strand, then you're going to prove me wrong. <laughs> what do I think the new normal is? I think, I think the independent filmmaker is going to thrive. I think those who wear many hats and know how to make films on a dime are going to thrive because I wouldn't feel comfortable taking my normal investor's investment in health. I, I am working with my investors at a fraction, at one fifth of their normal investment, strictly because I don't want to be shut down during another pandemic. I don't want to risk hurting a large crew, getting people sick. I mean, you, like everybody else, we're talking about a, care, a, a story with maybe two actors here and two here, and maybe their storylines will intersect, maybe they won't, and knock this thing out in a short amount of time with a crew of six or eight. I think we'll generally get back. I think we'll get. I think we'll get to a point where people are going to get very complacent. Um, I, I compare it to you know we did a film in the Everglades years ago with Emmett and Furla um, in the Everglades and there's alligators all around and your first day on set you're paranoid to move. You're looking and there's eight to twelve foot alligators everywhere you look and. Then about by day three, you stop being paranoid and you get a little more comfortable. And then by day four or five, you're throwing a football with somebody and then the guy's like, dude, you need to step forward about three feet. You got an eight foot alligator like literally right behind you. And I think that's how this is gonna become. I think eventually, I, I don't see a, a vaccine coming anytime soon. It's just not the way it works. Um, and if they shipped it from overseas, I wouldn't take it. So I think I don't stand alone in that stance. I think we're happy to wear masks and PPE and let's get the story told. Um, safety first, but it's that way anyway. You know, you're not gonna put people in dangerous situations. So you figure out a way to stay socially distant and responsible. I think if a crew can quarantine together, then they can work together. It's working and, you know, it worked with football until they all went home. It's worked with basketball. I think there's no reason we can't do that with making our films. I think the new normal post COVID while we have it is gonna be smaller crews, shorter dates of shooting, uh, and 
and just, you know, figuring it out, you know, figuring it out. Shane, what protocols are you going to take for your upcoming film in this COVID reopening? Well, I mean, you first and foremost, you have to quarantine everybody out 14 days, which is important. I think everybody needs to know that they're clean uh, going in. You have to uh, test three times a week anybody who's acting and anybody who's in zone A. Zone A is considered the director of the DP, hair and makeup department, anybody who's coming in regular contact with the actors. Um, and then anybody in zone B would be tested once a week. But when you have a smaller crew, they assume everybody's in zone A. So everybody gets tested three times a week. So we'll test three times a week. I am gonna take temperatures at least twice a day. I'd like taking temperatures every morning and then every day after lunch, unless we had something spicy for lunch. We'll do it before lunch. Um, and we're just gonna kind of stay tight and be a traveling circus and just keep it intimate and tight, not let any outsiders in, not let anybody from the inside go out. It's like, hey, if you're committing and you're in, you're in. And if you're not, that's cool. We can't, we can't do this. Obviously, everybody's gonna have to wear PPE. Masks are gonna be mandatory. Actors will have to wear masks until we say, let's roll action. Um, actors are gonna have to be comfortable doing their own hair and makeup, even though we'll have somebody that handles props, hair and makeup, and wardrobe. I can't have them hovering. So I, I want actors to come camera ready and they can be touched up. And we're not doing a project that's elaborate. We're not doing Moulin Rouge. Um, uh, wardrobe is gonna be owned by the cast. We're gonna use our own wardrobe. We're gonna keep it minimal changes. We're gonna use locations that we control. We're not interested in using these locations that are used by the general public or rented or chartered for the day. They're gonna be, okay, we're going to his house. We're shooting at his house today. He's been quarantining there for two weeks. We're going outside to this ranch. We're going outside to this wash. We're, we're going to do stuff outside. We have very minimal inside. The, actually, the only interior scenes that we have is an office that has been closed for months that a friend of mine owns that he's given us and um, a cabin out in the mountains that has been vacated now for going on a year. So um, we know it's clean. And that's it. That's everything else is exterior or in a car. And when you say no one's going out, so how do you how do you ensure that the cast and crew? I mean, I realize they're going to have very little downtime, but somebody could sneak down to. Hey, you know what? It's on. It's on them. If if they want to if they want to jeopardize it, I can't. I you know I I work with people I've known a long time and I trust. We're going to have a crew of six to eight. We're going to travel. We're going to we're going to be a traveling circus. Mm -hmm. So if somebody wants to sneak out of the motorhome, I'm going to probably know they're sneaking out of the motorhome. I mean, you know, we got two motorhomes. They each sleep. No, they each sleep 10, but we're going to have a crew of six and four actors. So, you know, uh, we'll know. <laughs> that's the only way I do it is you got you to gotta keep some form of control. You know, that's what's happened is football. Why is football getting the COVID problem right now? Because everything was controlled when these guys were at training camp because they were, they were kept in a bubble, just like basketball successfully did. And then, as we all said, let's take an office pool. You want to go four weeks or five before the NFL starts shutting down games. Well, people go home. Then they start traveling, and then they come back from a game, then they go out with their friends, and then they go to a strip club, or they go wherever, and then they go play a game, and then these two teams play, and these guys mingle, and then they take it all with them. And that's what's happening. That's why you're seeing games getting canceled and teams getting shut down. You know, It's happening now. We're only in week three. <laughs> right. And we're not even in the cold season, and isn't that when COVID is most... That's when COVID, I think, is going to be the worst. So yeah, I mean, we're going we're gonna to take all the precautions necessary um, we're, we're just, yeah, that's how we're, that's the only way we can do it. It's the only way we can do it. Do you see yourself flying anytime soon? I love flying. But I mean, <laughs> in terms of... We have a plane in the movie too, I forget. Oh, oh There's great. a plane. Oh, okay. Somebody will be flying. We got a little Piper Cub. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of taking a commercial flight, yes. With recycled air. I, I, I would not right now want to go on a plane. I would, knowing, knowing whether or not I've been exposed to COVID is the big mystery in the house, but... Let's say I have, I wouldn't want to get on a plane now because I think for the first time in our lifetime, we're thinking about the air we breathe mm -hmm. and the close contact we make with people we don't know. And I, because the way we've all had to rethink and relook at tight spaces, oh, the thought of being on a plane with people right now or ever, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't want to do it. How does a director build strong relationships with their actors? Director builds strong relationships with actors. You know, it's all about trust. It's an actor is going to decide in the first 
30 seconds of meeting a director if this is somebody they can work with. They've, they've sized you up. It's almost like having a blind date. Um, they size you up when you walk through the door. You know, what can I get away with? What are they gonna command from me? Are they gonna stretch me and make me into something better? Or can I put this in cruise control and just kind of ride it out? And what I've found is I, I like to listen to an actor. Um, I like to let an actor know that I, I run a, a set that's very relaxed. I, I'm not a, a yeller, I, I trust. I said, if you're here, it's because I trust you. Now we just gotta get to the point where you trust me. Um, so I let actors know that you know, what's important to me is I get the movie that we need to make. Give me what I need and I'll give you what you want every time. If you show up prepared and you're able to give me in the time allotted to do the scene what I need, I will give you what you want. And I know nine times out of 10, what you want is gonna be better than what I need. And I find when I tell, and that's true, that's not lip service. I, won't, I don't say that to every actor, but you know, when I'm dealing with my leads and people that I trust that have earned that, I find that barrier comes down and they start to get excited and realize that this is a safe place. You know, I, I learned something very interesting from Martin Sheen when we were doing a film together 100 years ago. He was telling the story of when he had a heart attack on Apocalypse Now. And he was being wheeled into surgery and his dear wife, Jan, looked over him and said, it's only an effing movie, Martin. And he told that story, but Apocalypse Now is one of the most known films in our history. It's huge. And I never forgot that story. And I never forgot that it's only a movie. You know, relationships are forever. There's 33,000 movies a year that are probably made through SAG. Why is this one gonna be any more special than the next or less important than the next? It's only a movie. We're not curing cancer. We're not curing COVID. What's most important is people feel better after the experience than they did coming into it for me. Um, and I want my actors to feel respected. I want them to feel like they can grow. I want them to feel like they can challenge me because I hope I become a better filmmaker because of our experience, you know? And um, I think if you go in allowing an actor to stretch their legs, keep them reined in when you have to, but trust when you make a decision on an actor, that is who you have entrusted that role and that story to be told by through their eyes and their vision. I think it's important to let an actor feel like they, they can have the freedom to play and to explore and experiment. And then as a, as a director and an actor, I think you can find that middle ground where you're getting the story and the performance that you need as a filmmaker but as an actor and an artist, they're being able to, to fly in a way that they don't feel stifled or congested or condemned. And I think if you can find that balance, I mean, you look at some of the great relationships that some directors and actors have. I mean, you can look at Spielberg and Tom Hanks, or Zemeckis and Tom Hanks when they work together on Castaway and some of the other films. And um, you, you try to get one one hundredth of that greatness or that relationship. And, and I find that. I, I've never walked away working from an, uh, never walked away working with an actor regretting the experience. Didn't matter who it was or what the project was. I've, I've never walked away from an actor regretting it. And I hope they feel the same for me. Do you think um, most sets are as stressful as Apocalypse Now was? Or, or what percentage, I should say, I think, ever reached that point? I think a lot of sets are unnecessarily stressful. It's, it's something I talk about in my book. I think especially young filmmakers put so much stress and pressure. They are making a movie because God damn it, it's getting into Sundance or our bust. And that is like the least thing you should be worried about. Make a good movie, learn and enjoy this experience. You may never do it again. It's like, it's like they tell you in Rudy, you know, you may be putting on the football uniform for the last time, enjoy it, live in the moment. And I tell filmmakers that this could be your one and only chance to tell a story as a director before it fails and you have to go sell stocks or become an insurance salesman or whatever it is that you could do. Nothing wrong with that, but being a filmmaker is a dream, okay? There's very few people who can make a living at it. So I always tell people, look, this, is, this could be the only time you're ever gonna do it, you might as well enjoy it. And I think if you enjoy it and the people around you feel that you're enjoying it, it's gonna be a much more pleasurable experience when people are happy they deliver better things. I find that people put unnecessary stress on themselves because they, they just don't see it with the end in mind. They're so worried about what they're getting. And I think that's the importance of being 
knowledgeable in editorial. Every filmmaker before they want to, you know, before they become a, a director and before they become a writer, I think they need to spend three to five years in the edit bay fixing other people's mistakes. Because one reason I'm able to maintain a good demeanor, I know when I make a film, it's because I know when I nail something, how I'm going to use it. I know exactly how many frames of it I'm going to use. I know exactly where in the story I'm going to use it. And it just, it's not arrogance. It's, it's just confidence. It's knowing the craft of telling a story. It doesn't mean my movies are great, but I look at something and I don't overshoot. I don't get a lot of takes. I don't need it. Um, I trust my cameraman. I trust my actors and I trust myself to tell the story. And I think if, if people can just kind of, and it goes back to hiring the right people. People can just kind of take a breath and enjoy the moment and just realize that we are so blessed to be able to do this. I think they'd be pretty surprised with the, the outcome that they get when they look at the dailies. I think they'd be pleasantly surprised. And with Apocalypse Now, weren't there things just completely out of Coppola's control that, I mean, what they were going on with the government at the time, you know, with, with the different locations. There is. Things happen. There is always problems on a film. And as I, as I try to stress, and we've talked about earlier, I over pre produce a film. So that way, when something, when a little bit, you know, a wheel comes off the wagon or a lug nut gets loose, it's not a catastrophe. I'll give you an example. When we were doing our last film, I wrote a part, or, you know, CJ wrote a part with, with my request for a specific actor I was a big fan of. I fell in love with an actor on a show. I knew I could get to them and I wrote a part for them and we made a deal and this actor was gonna be part of the film. And long story short, the day we showed up to shoot, I got a call from her agent. She said her father just died. She's gotta jump on a plane and go to Detroit. We're so sorry, just reschedule it. She'll, she'll be back in five, six days, reschedule it. I said, I wish I could. It's the only time I'm here. We work at a very quick pace. We got to figure this out. I said, I'm going to go to you first. You have another actor you want to give me that you feel can do the role. And he was funny. He goes, oh my God, I can't believe you're not freaking out. I said, no, I'm concerned about the actor and her well-being for her dad. I will reach out to her. But I said, I want you to think about somebody you have on your roster. You've got, you've got 20 minutes before I start making calls to other agents. And he called me. He said, I've got somebody. And I don't want to name names, but it, it ended up being a, a pretty damn good get. And um, it's, it's about not losing it. It's about just taking a breath and realizing it's only a movie. It'll all figure itself out. That's what we have to do, you know. Um, it's the only way to make it work. You know, our biggest day of shooting on break even, I had nine cameras. I had an entire cast and half my crew get food poisoning at the hotel from bad ice. We're, our call time that day was 8 a.m. We're supposed to start rolling cameras at 10. I think people started showing up around 12.30 or 1, the ones that did show up and didn't go to the hospital. And I didn't start shooting my biggest day of the film until 1.30, 2 o'clock. And I, I had a choice. I could yell and scream. I could throw a fit. Um, I could kick a seagull. It was at the ocean. Um, and I realized getting upset wasn't going to make my casting crew better. It was only going to let my existing cast and crew realized I was out of control. And I decided to just deal with what we got. Let's make it work. And you know, it worked. Of course, when I watched the scene back, I wish I would have had more time. Of course, when I watched the scene back, I wish I would have gotten more angles. But I'm pleased with what we got. And because of my knowledge in post, I knew exactly how we had to do this now with a fraction of the time. And it just comes from confidence in telling a story, being understanding the editorial process. So those are things that are out of your control. You know, shot another scene and there was a construction, you know, we went and scouted it, got a permit, had a whole scene, and it turned out they started building a house or demolishing a house right across from it. You know, what do you do? That's out of your control. And it's a very dialogue heavy scene that you know you're not gonna loop. So you, you, you find the nicest person and the most reasonable person on your crew to go over and talk to the foreman and work out and say, hey, we're here for two hours. Can we do this? Can we? We go, you go. We go, you go. And they worked with us. You know, this is what it's about. What did Gary Busey teach you about being a director? Gary Busey taught me so much about being a director. The first narrative I ever directed starred Gary Busey. Talk about, you know, baptism under fire. <laughs> um, Gary is unbelievably talented. Gary is, he brought, you know, he brought 40 years to the table. 
I mean, there's a guy who had done, you know, 75 movies when I worked with him at this point. Here I was directing my first. I, of course, produced and written a lot of stuff but never directed before. So um, I learned how to take a punch, and I don't mean physically. I mean, I learned how to take a punch. I learned how to, to improvise. I learned how to be strong. Because when you work with an actor like Gary Busey or the late Dennis Hopper, those guys are constantly testing you. They, they get more pleasure out of trying to break you to find out how tough you are and they're gonna decide what they're gonna give you with your toughness. And I found, you know, and I, I produced a film with Marlon Brando and I know his tricks and what he used to do to directors and I'd watch him do it and he would give two takes that were almost identical and see which one the director liked better and if he knew the director liked the one he didn't really care about, then he, he phoned it in, he didn't care. And he, he messed with directors, and Gary messes with directors, and Dennis messed with directors. And I, I, I encourage new filmmakers to go work with guys like that because if you can cut your teeth on that, it's, it's gonna, you're gonna learn, you're gonna have seven years of film school in one day with a guy like that. And what was really cool about Gary is the way he helped me develop the character and work through the character and what he demanded and commanded of me as a filmmaker before we started. He was very involved in working this out and making it happen. And then when he showed up on set, it was so neat. I remember we did take one. And I remember I said, and cut. And he turned and he goes, notes, give me notes. <laughs> and I was like, I got 25 people looking at me waiting for me to go tell Gary Busey, Academy Award winner or Academy Award nominee, Golden Globe guy, you know, tell him. And I was scared to death. And I walked up to him. And I realized what it was, it was a show. And I just went up to him, I put my hands on his elbows. I said, Gary, that was fricking brilliant. I wanna get it again. Will that make you happy? And he looked at me, he goes, dude, come on, they're all looking at us, give me a goddamn note. And I looked at him, I said, a little bit more pause when you go to sit down before you give him that line that, you know, and he goes, there we go. And that was the only note I gave him all day just because he wanted a note. And I was so out of my league at the time, and I was so out of, out of the, you know, knowing how to deal with the moment. And he covered me, but he 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 didn't need the note. He he showed up more prepared than anybody, and just knocked it out of the park and did exactly what I had hoped he would. And we had rehearsed it, but he tried to toughen me up and show me that I need to be more vocal as a filmmaker in front of people. Don't just say action cut. That was great. Let's get it again. You know that was. It, it's about interacting, and I learned so much from that experience. And you know I've worked with some great actors. You know like Jane Seymour and. You know Dennis Hopper and and you know good lord the list goes on and on and and um, every one of those gives so much to each project that we've done together and I learn so much. But Gary, yeah, Gary, Gary was baptism by fire. He kicked my ass right in a gear. That was I knew once I once I wrapped on Busey, <laughs> life got really easy. It's amazing. <laughs> Why would an actor on that level of that caliber want to test someone? They, it's about, I think, control. It's about how much I am willing to give. And I'm not, it's like, I look at it as a relationship. If you're in a relationship with somebody and you're interested in taking that next level of intimacy, you're gonna put some feelers out to see if this is somebody that you can trust and go that deep with emotionally. And I think actors like to try to break you down. Some of them are just flat out assholes and like to control a set. And those are who they are. And Gary was not that way at all. What he wanted to do is he wanted to see, he wanted to push my limits to see how much he was willing to give back. And the reason he wanted to do the film, it's a funny story. I sent the script to his son, Jake, to, to play a part. Gary intercepted it, called me and said, Jake's not available. He's in Miami doing a pilot for NBC. I read the script, who's playing Earl Cooper? And I was like, uh, uh, uh. And there was an actor kind of attached and he goes, well, I want to play it. I've done 75 films and I've never read a character like this or been able to play this part. And I'd really like to play him. I mean, I, I sorry to kind of bogart the script, but I, I want to do it. And he wasn't looking for a job. I mean, he was busy and I wasn't paying anything. So it wasn't like he was getting any money. Um, so I went and met with him at his house and we talked and just the first time I sat with an actor of that caliber and listened to him break down a script that I wrote. And what he did is he taught me the importance of what happens off the page. You know, he said, look, you, you, you know, Shane, you've given me, you've given me page one to page 88. And I'm more interested about what's before page one. And that's his story. You know, and Gary went into 
this guy's childhood and what made him who he is today. And it, it, it really opened my mind as a storyteller and as a writer and as a director because now I understood how actors thought. So it was an amazing experience that I would work with Gary a hundred times over and, you know, twice on Sunday. It was a, a great experience.